right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first meeting of the first of many meetings of the Joint uh, e Economic Development and Education and Culture Committee. Uh, this is a topic today that's really near and dear to my heart and all of our hearts. You see the great presence here today. Uh, it's a key strategy about how we are going to make sure uh, we are filling the jobs that are available in Montgomery County and putting everyone on a pathway uh, for greater opportunity. Uh, and so today we're going to be, this is the first of a series of meetings. Uh, we're going to hear from Work, WorkSource Montgomery and MCPS about their work. Uh, obviously, economic development and workforce development are in, integral and tied together. Uh, and there's a lot of components. Obviously, our college, Montgomery College, USG are a big part of that. We'll explore that in future meetings. Um, but really excited to be with my colleague and uh, co-chair here today to dive into this. Um, last session, last council, I was I had the unique opportunity to be on the Planning, Housing, Economic Development Committee and on Education and Culture, which was the one that met on this topic. And I was always really deeply, deeply engaged in these issues. Uh, Mr. Featherstone knows I, before his time, I used to be a contractor at WorkSource Montgomery uh, and set up the Summer Rise program, so we'll, I can't wait to get into the stuff that's happening at MCPS on that front. Um, but this is really important, and uh, you see from the attendance today that everyone here cares about this issue, um, and it's going to be a really, really important focus of this council and of this joint committee. Um, so with that, I want to ask uh, my co-chair if she wants to make some remarks. I'm sure she does. Good morning, everybody. This is my first time in this room. <laughs> right. It's so strange to me. Um, as, you, as you know, uh, when I became chair of the Economic Development Committee during this first session, I looked into MCPA's data, performance data, for kids in second grade, third grade, fifth grade, and it shocked me. Uh, have seen the levels of the math performance and literacy performance of our children is a huge problem and we need to talk about it. This is the future workforce and that's why I call on having this meeting with uh, the Education Committee to ensure that we were going to work side by side to make sure that our kids will have the tools that they need to succeed. So I don't want this to be a meeting where we're only gonna talk about the great things that we're doing as a county, which is awesome, but we also need to talk about the challenges and the things that we're not doing. Otherwise, this is not gonna be uh, a successful effort. Um, so I'm asking people to be, be, you know, be very upfront, uh, recognize the challenges that we are facing and how we as a community can work together to ensure that we're doing the very best to ensure that we are developing a great workforce for the future. Uh, starting with our young kids, not just high school, but the, the very little ones. Um, you know, we as a county, we are trying to make sure that we have, you know, access to early childhood education. You know, by the time so by the time our kids go to, you know, get to kindergarten, they already have the tools needed to succeed. So that's also part of this conversation. Um, and with that, I think we should just take off and start with uh, our friends for. WorkSource Montgomery, unless somebody else from the committee would like to say a couple words. If not, we can just dig in. Um, so I'm going to take over WorkSource right now. Okay. So <laughs> maybe um, if Ms. Sarah Van, Sarah from Director of Government and Board Relations, Sarah Van the Weird, is she here? I think Anthony, <clears throat> Anthony oh. is the head, so he'll represent everybody. Okay, yes. You're, she's listed on the agenda. She did. Well. I apologize. But the, this. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, go ahead, Anthony. Because you have you were second on my list. And John. Thank you. Um, so good morning to the the joint committee. Uh, we we appreciate this opportunity to um, talk about uh, the work that <clears throat> we're doing from a workforce development standpoint to to make sure that every resident. Um, has access, equal access to economic opportunity. Um, as we speak today, <clears throat> we won't be speaking from a just the WSM perspective. We're, we're speaking from a perspective of, of collaboration and partnership. Um, everything that we do um, is a collaboration with our partners of MCPS, Economic Development, uh, Universities of Shady Grove, Montgomery College, and, and all the nonprofits <clears throat> that uh, provide workforce development services throughout the county. 
Uh, I'm joined today by my, my colleague, John Hattery, uh, Deputy Director of Workforce Services for WorkSource in Montgomery. And I don't know if I should introduce Brad Stewart uh, with, with MCEDC, Brad, I don't want to butcher your, your title, but um, I know you're a VP there, right. so I'll just leave it leave it at that. But uh, we're, we're happy to talk to you a little bit um, about the uh, workforce needs that we see right now um, from a data standpoint, and then we'll get into um, kind of our approach and methodology for serving Montgomery County job seekers and, and businesses. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, John Hattery, first, so he can talk a little bit about data. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I do that on Zoom meetings, too. Um, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, part of the invitation to the meeting uh, asked for some level setting as it related to data as far as the LMI, labor market information, current for Montgomery County. Um, our unemployment rate is very low at 2.8% for the county. That's as of this month. Fresh, fresh data from, uh, from our LMI uh, tool that we use. For context, nationally, the average is about 3.8. That's considered full employment by economic uh, labor, for, labor force economists. So I guess we're extra full employment here in Montgomery County. Um, but we do have a total of about 15,000 unemployed folks. Obviously, that's an area of focus for WorkSource Montgomery. Um, the labor market in general continues to be tight. Um, for every unemployed person, there's two job postings, and that's been consistent for quite a while. Um, moving on to the next slide, Essie, please. So of the folks that don't have jobs right now, for whatever reason, they're either being retrained or they're moving on or they've decided they want to do something else with their life or they've, uh, they are yet, as yet acquiring the skills to be able to become employed on, uh, with long-term labor market attachment, as we like to put it. Uh, the demographics for the folks who right now are unemployed, um, from an age standpoint, uh, most of them are between 25 and 34 and 35 and 44. Um, there are more female people who are unemployed than male people. Um, from an ethnicity standpoint, um, the percentage of Hispanic and Latino folks who are not working is very, very small, about 2,000 total, a little over. Uh, the balance is non-Hispanic or Latino folks. And from a uh, unemployment by race standpoint, uh, large majority of of, of the folks who are unemployed right now are either black, African American, or white, smaller, much smaller percentages among Asian folks, uh, American Indian, and Alaskan Native, or um, my eyes aren't good enough to see that. I'm sorry. Um, from an industry standpoint, where are we as far as our industries here in Montgomery County? Um, it will be a surprise to no one in this room that government is the number one industry in this, in this area, uh, far outstripping the national average. But if you go down now for the next five or six industries that are listed, you'll see uh, our friends from professional scientific and technical services. That's going to include our life sciences industry. That's going to include our IT and, and information technology uh, uh, industries, healthcare, social assistance, retail trade, and then this next one is uh, other services except public administrators. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, around waste management. That's all, what I would call pseudo governmental category. And then after that, we've got our construction, finance, um, and educational services. So what I wanted to highlight about that is that as part of our work at WorkSource Montgomery, we're uh, we are tasked with with designating industries of emphasis for us, and our industries of emphasis align with these top industries, hospitality, construction, IT, life sciences, healthcare. Um, and then the, the, the graph on the other side is just um, earnings by, you know, what, uh, what occupations and industries are affording uh, individual residents the highest pay. We thought that would just be interesting for the community to see. Now, in-demand skills, um, these are the things that are being reported uh, and, and, and gleaned from our labor market tools. It relates to job postings, the skills that the job postings are asking for um, uh, in the prospective employees. 
um, you'll see that many of these with you know the top three all related to computer science auditing uh, after that is marketing um, then we have nursing finance accounting and then we get back into areas around IT um, and this is reflected by the uh, by WorkSource's work as it relates to the trainings that we're providing for county residents to try to give them the, the hard technical skills that they need to to acquire long-term long-term employment and then the next one we talk about into again in-demand skills these are a little bit different and here that talks about communications management customer service um, uh, leadership um, so at WorkSource Montgomery what informs our work okay workforce development there's five pieces to the employment puzzle okay and so what we've tried to do is develop a system of programming that meets the needs of these five pieces one is academic training most you know our friends at MCPS take care of most of that Montgomery College USG and others however some workforce programs do have remedial uh, education services and so we we make sure that those are in line with what's in demand for our county right so one is academic services. The other one is hard skills. Those skills that we talked about just in the slide prior around Python, Java, and the rest of them, those are credential-based trainings, things that give people certifications that make them qualified to apply for a job, okay? The next one is um, soft skills. Some of the things that we're talking here, employability skills. People don't like the term soft skills, but it is what it is. We have to help our folks that come to us make sure that they're ready to have a good day at work even when they're having a bad day on the way to work. And make sure that they're having a good day at work even when their boss isn't having a good day at work. And so we deliver these skills either through one-on-one -on -one counseling with our career advisors, workshops, other programs, and it's augmented by many of the partners we have around the county. Um, the fourth piece of the employment puzzle is personal infrastructure. Are they have, do they have stable housing? Are they food secure? Do they have childcare? Do they have transportation? As we get to the end of our most, the, the, the end part of the engagement for WorkSource Montgomery is put, connecting people with jobs, okay? If we don't account for personal infrastructure within that process, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot, okay? If somebody can't get to work, if somebody doesn't have childcare, they're not gonna be able to thrive and survive on the job. And so we, we make sure that we take very, very clear inventory of the folks who are coming through our program to make sure that personal infrastructure is accounted for in the placement process. And then last but not least is professional facilitation. That's the workforce professional that's sitting in front of your constituents, talking to your constituents, trying to guide them, uh, level set expectations, in some cases have to tell them, have to say hard things to them because they aren't qualified for a certain thing until they take certain trainings. Um, but it's the professional facilitation from a case management standpoint, from a placement standpoint, that, that rounds out the five pieces. Everything we do and the rest of the stuff that Anthony is gonna share with you is kind of built around that. When we look at, a, when we look at a, a, a program or an individual engagement, if we're having problems in, with placement and getting people to work, likely the answer is because we're not rising to the level in one of those pieces of the employment puzzle. And then I will hand it over to Anthony. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> who, who, who we are? Uh, work, WorkSource Montgomery is synonymous with our county's local workforce development board, um, which is authorized by the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and I'll refer to that as WIOA moving forward. And so, um, WIOA authorizes <clears throat> the Workforce Development Board and, and, and WorkSource Montgomery as the fiscal entity um, to carry out those services. So, we work collaboratively. Um, and managing our American Job Center or AJC network, which includes a, <clears throat> a multitude of partners from Division of Rehabilitation Services, Maryland Department of Labor, Job Corps, um, Health and Human Services, and a few other partners. Um, our, our goal is, is pretty simple. We want to uh, learn and understand the needs of our, our local businesses, and we want to translate that to the work that we do with our residents from an employment and training standpoint. Next slide, please. And so we also thought it was important to mention where we are right now and how residents engage with us. Um, we're, we're happy to report that over the past two years, we've been able to add three locations um, as to where residents can engage. 
uh, with their American Job Center network. Um, most recently, in addition to the, the centers located in Germantown and the East County Regional Services Center and our uh, comprehensive center located in Wheaton, we have restarted the uh, job center at the Montgomery County Correctional Facility uh, and have a dual track reentry program. And what that means is uh, we have staff that are dedicated solely to serving returning citizens of justice affected individuals inside the Montgomery County Correctional Facility as well as the American Job Center. Um, we saw a great need there and we didn't want to lump services for that population into our, our general services. So we have a set aside department uh, specifically working with our justice affected residents. I'm also happy to report the Mobile Job Center is in the community. Um, we had our first event this past weekend at an um, Islamic event. Uh, we, were, we were able to engage residents that we would not be able to engage, um, typically waiting for folks to come to us to our brick and mortar sites. Um, and as a result of the pandemic, I'm sure it's no surprise that we have a virtual career and job training center. Um, the exciting thing about that, that it has, it, is that it has unlimited capacity. Every single Montgomery County resident uh, unemployed, underemployed, gainfully employed can access this center uh, to receive uh, services from professional development all the way to um, occupational skills trainings and so forth. It's also available to businesses. We see a lot of our small businesses take advantage and utilize this as a, a learning management system for compliance trainings um, as well as occupational skills trainings for their incumbent workforces. So uh, that's where we are right now and that's how residents engage with us. And just jumping into our, our approach um, a little bit, you know, we, we have a five-pronged approach. It starts with <clears throat> engaging with our community, um, making sure that we understand the needs of our community. We have uh, robust and meaningful partnerships um, with community-based, faith-based organizations, uh, government, uh, for-profit entities, and, and, and everybody that is a connective tissue to, to the businesses and residents that we serve. Um, business engagement. Uh, is, is at the forefront. We do as businesses uh, tell us to do or as they lead us to do to meet their talent needs. Um, and that's critical and we're, we try to be nimble and pivot as much as we can to, to meet the needs of our, of our businesses. Uh, and once we understand those needs, it's all about talent pipeline development. What are we doing with our, our residents, our job seekers, as uh, Mr. Hattery mentioned, to help them get upskilled uh, and, and, and placed into employment and, and career pathways. Not just about the job that we help you get placed in, but what's the next step and, and, and steps beyond that so that you can continue to grow and progress. WIOA is our federal core program um, that uh, provides a lot of uh, funding for the operation of our American Job Centers as well as uh, funds to serve businesses as well as our, our, our residents. Um, it's very important that we um, Pay close attention to WIOA because it's important that Montgomery County is out in front when it comes to our federal performance. And I'm happy to report that our, our most recent federal performance um, report, as uh, reported by Maryland Department of Labor, um, saw a lot of progress um, than the, the prior reports. And there's a lag with WIOA performance, but I won't get into that right now. But it's important that we're, we're a leader when it comes to the WIOA program. <clears throat> and I think, last but not least, it's system building. Um, we can't do this in a vacuum. We don't want to do it in a vacuum. We want to be partners. We want to make sure that the entire ecosystem is working together and, and talking. So we're not sending residents and businesses here, there, and everywhere, creating a level of fatigue. We're working together um, as a coordinated unit and system behind the scenes. Next slide. So community engagement, <clears throat> uh, really briefly, we, we, we take a uh, an alternative approach than most workforce boards. Most workforce boards go out with numbers in mind. Um, our community impact team does not go out with numbers in mind. Our community impact team goes out to the community to give. Uh, give information, give knowledge about the resources available to, uh, to upskill, train in place um, residents or uh, the services available to businesses. Um, you may have seen our community impact team at uh, community events, doing job fairs or operating the mobile job center. Um, but through this uh, public education process on the, the services available through our public workforce system, um, we've created a good problem for our AJC network. We have um, an excess, I guess, of, of residents that are seeking services. Um, and we're increasing capacity so that we can meet, uh, meet that need. Um, and that's exactly what we want. We want residents to know where we are. But more importantly than knowing where we are and what we do, they're able to access our services seamlessly. And it all starts with um, our community impact and engagement team. Um, business engagement, <clears throat> uh, there's a, a two-pronged approach. We, we offer basic services. 
uh, which include job fairs, uh, you know, providing labor market information. Businesses use our facilities um, often. Our, our state uh, job uh, board to help match with participants. Um, and there's a whole level of core services that we offer every Montgomery County business. Um, but then we get to some specialized services that relate to providing subsidies to train um, uh, newly onboarded workers, uh, subsidies to train incumbent workforces, and then we also have uh, special programs in direct response to the pandemic to uh, aid in recovery. And you'll see just some numbers about what our business services team, um, including all of our partners in the AJC network, have accomplished in um, 21 through 22. Next up, talent pipeline development. This is what we're doing with our, our job seekers. We're bringing that five-piece puzzle together to make sure that we have well-rounded uh, candidates that are being referred to our local businesses. Um, there's some uh, core services that is offered to, that are offered to uh, every Montgomery County resident. Um, but in addition to those core services, when when more is needed to, to upskill in place, uh, we have a, a specific set of training services. We uh, work with uh, specific training providers. Montgomery College is one of our, our largest training providers, no, no surprise. But we uh, pay for training through the individual training account process. Um, and we uh, also offer support services so that residents can focus on training and hopefully try to mitigate the financial obligations that may arise while they're in training that usually hinder you from finishing finishing the training that you're in. And, um, you know, we don't train just to train. We have a full complement of business services uh, staff members that are out and about interfacing with employers to, to help place uh, in partnership with all of our AJC partners, um, place residents in, into viable career pathways. Uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, um, what you'll see in front of you are a list of the core partners that we work with in our AJC network. Some are not listed. We also have a financial empowerment center through the United Way National Capital Area that has a, a financial literacy services offered every day of the week um, inside and outside of our American Job Center. And you'll, you'll see some of the, uh, the, the numbers that represent um, residents served and, and some of the achievements through the AJC network um, in uh, the, the PY22 for the state, but it's 21 through 22, that program, yeah, I guess it would be FY23 for, for the county. Um, but that's just a little bit about uh, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. What are we doing to operate the AJCs? Um, to increase access to services, to train upskill residents and place into employment. And last but not least, our last priority, system building. This is a big one for us. Um, it's last but certainly not least. Fatigue is a thing in, in the workforce development space with businesses and residents. You have a resident who can receive services from multiple entities and they end up having to go here, there and everywhere. Um, and they get uh, exhausted and discouraged and they, they disengage. Um, same thing with businesses. I, I walk out of the office and John walks in next, and we're kind of singing the same story um, about the same resident. So what we're doing is uh, a lot of work to connect, interconnect our workforce system. Um, with any system, uh, you need to know who makes up the system. We uh, did a community asset map. Um, it's a 200-page document that you're free to read whenever you'd like to, but if you're like me, um, you'd like to press the easy button and we have an e-service locator where you can easily see who does what with whom and where they're located at. <clears throat> and it's a great tool for residents because they can see what's offered and in what proximity to where they live. Practitioners can see uh, who they can maybe partner with and leverage some uh, potential synergies. Um, and businesses also can use the tool to see who's providing uh, employment and placement services. Um, so that's something that, that we're proud of that our, our partners all signed up for and it's incre excuse me, increasing the, the level of coordination. Uh, from the community asset map you notice that there are gaps in services and, and one of those responses to the gaps in services was our uh, workforce recovery network. That's a specialized group of community based providers uh, approximately 25 to 27 that we have contractual agreements with to expand programs. Interfaith Works, the Vietnamese American Services Center, Identity, uh, Gap Buster, Literacy Council of Montgomery County, Sunflower Bakery, just to mention a few. Um, and through the Workforce Recovery Network that launched a year ago, we're, we're reaching well over a thousand residents that our traditional AJC network would not reach. Um, so we're, we're super proud of that network and the work that they're, they're doing. Um, and that's just a little bit about our, our, our system building initiatives, but you know, I'll, I'll pause there and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I 
going to say that, uh, are you going to speak as well? So I'm, I'm Brad Stewart. I'm a senior vice president at Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. Our primary responsibility is attracting, retaining, and expanding strategic industries in Montgomery County, things like life sciences, hospitality companies. Um, and so I'm here to answer any questions that you may have regarding how those employers uh, view our workforce and challenges as they decide whether to be here or expand here. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I am going to open it up for um, board members to council members to ask questions. But before I open it to you guys, I have two questions. Um, I need to understand better how do you do outreach outreach to businesses to understand what skills do they need in employees? Like, how do you go to large companies and small companies and say? What are you seeing? What are the needs that you have for the future? So then you can work in collaboration with, you know, Montgomery College and, and the school system. So they're actually developing that pipeline. You know, that's what I want to get. So that's one question. And then a second one, but let's answer that one first. So great, great question. We do it in a variety of ways. Um, n number one, our workforce development board is comprised of 51% uh, or more of a business representative. We've uh, restructured that board um, and those committees this year um, to uh, have committees by industry. Um, and we're opening the committees up to outside members to get feedback from committee members um, or board members as well as uh, non-board members through those, those workforce development board members. Um, we look at the data, of course, as well. We have a, a, a team of business service reps that are connected to each local chamber. Um, to get the feedback through our, our chambers. There's a lot of anecdotal feedback that we get in working with um, the hundreds of businesses that we also work with. Um, our teams collaborate with MCED's team, MCEDC's team. Um, we participate with the Montgomery County Collaboration Board, which also has a lot of industry rep representation. So it, it's a multitude of ways, and there are more ways that we, we engage. Um, I think the area of opportunity, I think, as a whole is to figure out how to maybe coordinate to get more information from the masses and bring that back and, and figure out you know, how, to, how to aggregate it and, and, and turn it into um, system improvements. But there's a, a variety of ways that we get information. And, and how you communicate that with the school system to ensure that they're actually building that pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's key. The second question before I, and then I'm going to go to from right to the left. So every, and then the second question that I have is how did you measure success in all your trainings like specifically I'm, I'm looking at the biotech boot camp that you guys have how do you make measure the success to see if you guys are on the right track with all those trainings with, with every one of our training programs success is measured um, by employment uh, we, we do have metrics related to do you complete the program is there a credential that you need to complete after the actual training program but the ultimate measure for success is um, do you find employment based on the training that you receive? Um, what type of wages are you making? And is there um, an outline plan for your next step to continue to develop your skills so you're not in the same place a year, two years from, from now after you finish training and get a, get a job? Do you have that on, on some type of report? Because that I want to see. Yes, we, we do. We track employment. Um, and, and retention at the six month and, and 12 month marks. So we can provide that information. Beautiful, thank you so much. I'm gonna ask my co-chair <laughs> to ask the next question and then we'll go from right to left, okay? Thank you, thank you. And just, I should have said this at the top, um, anytime you have co-chairs, one person kind of coaches the whole meeting and then you, ch you split up the parts that are more relevant to each committee. So council member, council chair, uh, Fanny Gonzalez is leading the workforce part that's more squarely in economic development. I'll lead the MCPS part. So just for colleagues' clarity and for our own clarity. Um, thank you for the presentation. You know, uh, one of the things to the point of metrics and goals, which we are all very focused on uh, because we want to uh, be able to understand the progress we're making and also uh, set new goals and understand where the gaps are. And uh, there used to be a number, and this is an old number, but I want to know what the number is today because I don't know, and I think it would be helpful for us to be focused on. Uh, this is maybe five, six years ago that we would say there were 30,000 or so open middle skill level jobs, you know, open jobs in the county at any given point, right? 
and that number was pulled from I think different sources and uh, it was obviously a moving target uh, but where are we with that and how would you come up with that number about how many open jobs are in the county right now and, and do you break those out by category and Brad can chime in on this too potentially how do we get that number so we all have it at, at the top of our mind and we know what it is and realizing it's not a perfect number but how, what's that high level number and how do you break it out by industry I, I do not have the, the actual number right now but we do look at that data frequently we use the light cast system which was formerly known as MC or, or burning burning glass and it tells us um, the information that you're speaking about as far as you know what positions or postings are actually available in the breakout by industry as well as education level um, that's requir required and, and, and so forth um, so we can provide that information and we do look it up when we do our data dives each month um, one additional data point that we're starting to look at is the underemployment data um, for our county and it, it's based on the population um, at a certain education level uh, versus the amount of jobs that require that education level um, and, and we do see an imbalance sometimes there's more people at a certain education level than there are jobs and then there's the vice versa where there are more um, jobs than there are people at that education level so that that's actually a data point that we've just started to to review and then get dig in with with our, our partners at Montgomery College um, but we, we can pull that information. We do look at it. I just don't have to. I don't want to report it. No, I appreciate it. If we just fought, and, and you're, you went where exactly where I was hoping you'd go, like out of that top line, there's a lot of things like the, you know, underemployment, the mismatch of skill, you know, so that we can dig in, so that we can answer the questions that my coach here was talking about, too. Like, how do we make sure we're laddering up and pathwaying to those open jobs? Um, so I think that's something that we'll want to track uh, along with you and just be very transparent about it and see where we are and help inform our. Uh, the second question, then we'll turn to colleagues that I had. Uh, you mentioned uh, numbers that I don't think have changed, but I want to know if you're tracking the change. You know, obviously, African American community have the highest unemployment levels. Overall level is low, but obviously disparities within that. And then women had higher unemployment levels, which I think we've seen nationally as a result of the pandemic. What is the percent change over the last couple of years? And you can get, you know. How has that changed 2019 to now as far as uh, women in the workforce? And is that something like we're looking at? Uh, and it, it, I think that's something we need to be looking at if you don't have the numbers today of what that dip has been. And now, now that we're starting to, employment numbers have started to come back up, what's that recovery looking like? And what are those industries, particularly for the diverse populations? I, I mentioned two, African Americans and women, but I think we need to be tracking it holistically. Yeah, and, and, and I agree we, we should, and I, I, I apologize, I don't That's have okay. those numbers yeah, yeah. in front of me right now, um, but we, we we will look into, um, I guess, the Delta versus where we were at that point and, and where we are right now. Um, I think that, I think one thing that's relevant to that point, Council Member Jawando, um, <clears throat> is that, uh, you know, there's 838,000 people that are of age to work in Montgomery County that are not counted in the um, labor force right now. We know some are in school that are not counted, but we know some are in school. We know some may be disabled and unable to work or have other reasons why they can't work. Um, some may be retired, uh, but we know that there is also a large number of discouraged workers that are not counted in the labor force. And, that, and that's where we're looking to go out in the community, engage those individuals, get them re-engaged in the labor force, get them trained and, and placed. I'm sorry, 200 and in 89,000. Yes, 838 was the top it's number like on that slide. 239,000. Uh, and I, I, I stand corrected. Thank you, John, for that. Um, and, and that's one of our major focuses so we can get them into the labor force and look at those those aggregated numbers or disaggregated numbers on, on unemployment. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I just think to the committee that we should follow up and just be aware of those two things. Turn it back to you. Council Member uh, Balkan. Um, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to I want to say it's great to have the new Economic Development Committee. Uh, it really underscores the importance of having a vibrant economy, and appreciate uh, Council President Glass for creating this committee. And it really shows the importance of education and workforce development. That one of our very first uh, meetings and, and joint meetings is with the uh, Education Committee. So workforce development is at the center of economic development. 
and it's great to see the partnership between WorkSource Montgomery, MCPS, Montgomery College, USG, and of course MCEDC. Uh, the employers, in my opinion, should be at the very center of everything we do in workforce development. And I know that there, that there are, um, uh, you've done a lot of work in engaging employers, and uh, I appreciate that. I, I think that as we go along, that's what I'll be focusing on, is just looking at how, the, how we really capture the, the employers. Uh, I appreciate uh, we recently, uh, post-pandemic, WorkSource Montgomery did have a, a networking event with, uh, with my chamber, the Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber, at their facility, and it was really a great way to bring in employers to see, this, to, to see what WorkSource Montgomery does, so I'd like to, like to uh, see that happen more often. Um, just a, a couple questions, and um, Brad, you might be the best person to answer this. When, of course, we need to recruit more businesses, but we also need to make sure that we're recruiting and retaining employees. So, can you talk a little bit about what you see as obstacles for that? And um, it would be great if um, uh, Mr. Featherstone, if you could chime in as to what you see as the obstacles of making sure we have a highly skilled, uh, credentialed workforce. Uh, thanks very much, Councilmember Council Member Balcom. And I'll, I think I'll address a question Councilmember Jawando asked too by using a specific example. So we, uh, as I said, are tasked with attracting, retaining, and expanding the strategic industries here for Montgomery County. Life sciences is a, is a good example of that. It's a very large employment base in Montgomery County, and I can give you a sense of scale of that. So. As of um, last year, the Milken Institute published a report. In the state of Maryland, the average salary is $69,000 a year. In life sciences, the average salary is $129,000 a year. So it's about 80% higher than the typical wage. About two-thirds of the life sciences industry in Maryland is located in Montgomery County. And as of today, we have approximately 1,000 vacant jobs in life sciences available to Montgomery County residents. Uh, that's not only a huge opportunity, it's a huge challenge. Uh, because I, I've said this before to the uh, previous Fed committee, uh, when we're looking to attract a life sciences company to Montgomery County, I get, exact, I get asked exactly two gating questions from them to decide whether or not we're going to have any further discussion. That is, one, can you physically accommodate us in your county? Uh, that sometimes is challenging and realistically outside of our control. Uh, if they're looking for 30 or 40 acres of land to build a large facility, that's just not available for any purpose in Montgomery County, quite honestly, or very challenging and expensive. The second question is, where's my workforce gonna come from? Uh, and the big challenge we face here is, right now that answer is very unsatisfactory to those companies, because their workforce is probably gonna come from taking an employee from a neighboring company and paying them more money, and then two years later having them leave again and go to the back to another company. That's a very large structural challenge that this state and county face that hasn't been addressed, and we're very much behind uh, other states in the United States who've spent the last 15 years realizing that smart investments in that area would have dramatic impacts on their, positive impacts on their economy. So that Milken Institute reported some other interesting things, uh, and that is we have grown our life sciences industry here substantially and significantly, uh, which from that context is we should all be proud of. Uh, what the Milken Institute report highlighted was we're still losing ground dramatically to competing states. So even though we're increasing, uh, we're not increasing nearly at the rate that our competitors are. Uh, and we're starting to see that be very significant in states that, like North Carolina, Texas, California, obviously Massachusetts, who've made these long-term investments. So there is a definite need and opportunity to figure out how to solve this problem. And you asked about industry involvement. The Maryland Tech Council began an effort about four years ago uh, that was taking uh, industry partners who actually hire these employees and working through what skill sets they needed to be able to uh, bring people in. And you see this, uh, I think Councilmember Jawando, you mentioned it, it's not just how do I get entry level employees into these jobs? It's how do I upskill or reskill people so that these jobs that are available that people have some skills for but aren't quite matched, those gaps can be closed and those jobs can be filled. 
so through that program, they've uh, actually stood up an institute called BioHub Maryland uh, to, to close that gap and train uh, employees. Uh, to date, they've received $5 million in funding from uh, the federal government and from the state government. And so I think the next opportunity is how that program continues to grow, launches, and uh, certainly the hope would be that that's located here in Montgomery County and supported by the county. Thank you for that. Do you were you going to mention? And, and, and so I, I would just add to that uh, that I think one of our biggest opportunities is related to the blueprint for Maryland's future. Um, among the uh, large tasks that our partners at MCPS have right now to, to implement the legislation, we're working um, really closely with, with our, our partners at MCPS to develop <clears throat> a, um, a really robust career counseling program that will be offered to uh, middle school and high school students um, in the very near future. And I think really demystifying career pathways um, through like a biohub tool through the Maryland Tech Council and other career pathways within um, information technology, construction, and other areas, as well as you know entrepreneurship, um, putting that in a, in a straight line, for lack of better terms, and, and, and getting um, career counseling deployed on an individualized level, which is what the blueprint calls for with our, our middle and high school students, I think is a huge opportunity for us to, to make sure that they understand what the pathways are here locally. Um, at a very young age and how to prepare for those decision points that they'll have um, with their education. And I, again, I'm going to reemphasize what I mentioned earlier today. We must make sure that kids who are in first and second grade, and that's going to be a follow-up question with, with the MCPS folks when they come here, they are ready with their math because by the time they get to middle school, sometimes it will be too late if kids don't have those basic skills right from the very beginning. Um, so. Anyway, Christian, do you want to? Yeah. Council member, can I add something to that? So it's interesting you mentioned that. So there, there are broad STEM-related skills. We realize that IT is another good area where we have significant challenges. Some of that's probably difficult for us to solve. There's a large challenge everywhere with obtaining security clearances uh, to fill a lot of these positions. That's more a federal issue, and I don't, I don't know that we even at the state level have a lot we can do about that other than encourage the federal government to be more efficient in that process. Uh, but clearly, almost every company, its we think of the IT industry, but IT is involved in every company that exists out there. And that's clearly one that Montgomery College and MCPS and others have tried to do a, a great job of putting together programs and coding camps and those sorts of things. What I think the state and county have sometimes lacked is a strategic focus. Uh, and you asked that question about K-12. through I mentioned Massachusetts before, 15 years ago they decided that life sciences was a strategic industry for their state. And so they sat down and said, what are the things we need to do to be competitive tomorrow and 10 years from tomorrow? Uh, and that began at the uh, college and university level, at the employer level, how do we solve the employment problem today? How do we improve our college and university systems to feed the two years, three years from now employees? And even fed back down to the K through 12, where they embedded STEM education uh, to feed people into those job pathways in the K through 12, knowing that was a 10 or 15 year down the road problem. But it's that strategic viewpoint, I think, that's important because um, you know th those students are going to be employees 10 or 15 years from now, right? So how do we how do we work on today, tomorrow, and the future? Thank you for saying that. Um, and again, I, this county loves to talk about equity and racial justice. Look at the map, the, the, the scores, the, the communities we're doing, the worst are black and Latinos. You know, we need to focus on that, on those kids, so they can take those jobs to make, you know, making uh, real money to get out of poverty. So that's how I'm seeing it. Uh, Kristen, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Fanny Gonzalez. Um, I wanted to just uh, quickly build on Councilmember Balcom's question uh, about barriers and and uh, ask if you are seeing housing costs as a particular barrier for recruitment or impacting the ability of uh, of our, our youth, our dislocated workers, or anyone else to be able to stay here while we help them find job placement. And uh, yeah, is that something that you're seeing or what's been your experience with that? We, we we do see it to a degree. Um, we do track migration data 
where people are coming from and, and where they are going. Um, we, we lose, <clears throat> I think, the most uh, workers to Prince George's County, Frederick, and, and Northern Virginia as a whole. Um, I, you know, I think anecdotally we, we've heard that housing costs play a fact and play are a factor in that, that process. Um, and then there are other reasons, if, if, you know, if based on the individual circumstances and so forth. But we, we have heard that anecdotally, um, and we do track the data as far as, like, where people are coming and where, where they're going. And so I can add, we, we don't necessarily, when we're talking about these higher paying industries see that same challenge because uh, frequently these companies are coming from equally as expensive areas to live. Um, so that's not, that's a neutral if not encouraging. Um, I do think that when you look at the data, uh, Montgomery Planning's actually done some good work looking at the Greater Seneca Life Sciences Corridor and where those workers come from. About 50% of those employees live in Frederick County or come from outside of Montgomery County, generally Frederick County. So. Uh, I think that's an issue for the council to think about is, you know, people working in the county but not necessarily being able to afford to live in the county. I think that's a realistic challenge. We may still have those jobs. We may not have them as residents. Mm -hmm. right. So that's one and two. Uh, it's been maybe two years now ago that Montgomery County Economic Development did a report with REACH advisors that looked at uh, a lot of important issues about our county. There were some very interesting things that struck me in that report. One. Uh, this county is aging. Um, we have two interesting challenges. Um, people live and grow up in Montgomery County and don't leave. Uh, they, they retire here. They don't go to Florida or other places like you see in a lot of other jurisdictions. Uh, that creates an, an aging workforce and also uh, increases the strain on our social services and other things like that. Two, I think it creates challenges in the neighborhoods that we see where um, people can't afford to move somewhere else, so neighborhoods re can retain, remain stagnant and, and not houses not be repaired and property values increase. And the third, when you look at that data, there are very few young people that are moving into Montgomery County. So our, our workforce is aging as we go along. So we see a very significant drain of these younger workers who go to Montgomery College or College Park or USG not being employed here in Montgomery County. They're leaving to go somewhere else even though they were born and raised here. Council member, of particular concern as it relates to that. Um, yes, the short answer to your question is yes, housing is, a, is an issue. Um, but one of the areas that we've partnered with the Purple Line Coalition is to examine those issues uh, as it relates to the, to the proposed stops along the southern tier of the county for the Purple Line the work that their group is doing and we're partnered with to try to make sure that we're reaching into those communities with the kinds of training and the kinds of workforce services that will allow them to retain uh, and get better jobs to be able to retain their, you know, their neighborhoods that they want to they choose, right? Um, that's just one example of, of a micro area that, that has our particular attention at this point. Thank you for that, for those uh, insights and certainly ones that will um, you know, be referring back to, I'm sure, as we continue to work on those issues with the broader council. Um, also, uh, related to uh, Chair Finding Gonzalez's point about uh, the importance of outreach to and connecting with our black and brown communities, um, on your, uh, in your annual report, your, your list of partner organizations has a lot of fantastic nonprofit organizations with really deep roots in our diverse communities, uh, which is wonderful to, to see. And I just, just wanted to check in about plans for um, long-term, ongoing, continued partnerships uh, with, those, with those organizations, um, you know, keeping in mind, of course, that they are dealing with, you know, the depletion of ARP funds and, and things like that. But it's such an important component here. So that, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, we... We, uh, we restructured our youth programs, our out-of-school youth programs, um, about two years ago, and we, um, we partnered with uh, several organizations, the Latin American Youth Center, Identity Incorporated, and Eckert um, Youth Alternatives, which is a national organization. Um, and there's a fidelity with those programs because they're funded through our uh, WIOA allocation, um, which, as long as WIOA is reauthorized, should come year over year. So there's, um, th those programs are, are performing um, really well, and, and we look to continue those those partnerships. That is a concern uh, with our workforce recovery network, <clears throat> which is recovery funded. 
um, those programs will continue through um, calendar year 2026. Um, we do have 25 partners, 25 plus partners in, in that network. So that's something that we're having internal discussions about on, you know, how can we continue the workforce recovery network and drop the R, drop the recovery and just turn it into a long-term network. Um, but we have to uh, develop a, a solid development strategy and execute on that development strategy to make sure that we can continue to expand services through these graduate organizations that have a better um, reach in the certain communities than the traditional AJC network. It's great to hear that you are proactively thinking about that and working and working on that because um, it's so central to I think you know the goals I think of our of our county. So that's great. Um, we'll be eager to continue to hear updates and please do let us know if there's uh, ways that you need us to help facilitate. Uh, and of course, we'll be in, in conversations with the nonprofits as well. Um, and my last question uh, was about um, your relationship with MCPS. Um, of course, we have uh, a great ongoing partnership with, you know, working to, to help ensure that our students are graduating um, ready to plug in where they want to into our, into our workforce. Um, MCPS also, of course, has struggled, especially recently, in filling positions that are these good union jobs. And I didn't see them listed as a partner in that sense. And so, you know, I wondered if there is a working relationship between Workforce Montgomery and MCPS in that sense, um, which I know that you uh, do have with, um, you know, with with some of our other uh, county county departments. So is that something that you all are thinking about or plugging into or, or that already exists? So we, we do work to try to um, recruit for some of the positions that fit the, the skill sets of those that we work with. We work with um, many individuals who have uh, higher barriers to, to employment. So we, we do look at the um, <clears throat> the jobs that, that make sense for our, our participants and try to, to work together on that level. Um, aside from that, on the program level, we, we work um, really, you know, hand in glove with the Partnerships Unit um, for the uh, annual Summer Rise program. Um, and we also work with uh, the CTE department. We partner to, um, uh, you know, help expand the Automobile Dealer Education Institute with 30 uh, plus young folks going to a registered auto service tech apprenticeship each year. And we're looking to hopefully expand that program. And then working together with MCPS on the blueprint for Maryland's future uh, career counseling component. So uh, we do work together on that level as far as trying to help fill those, those vacancies. I think some vacancies may be um, depending on who we're working with at that point in time or out of our wheelhouse for our federal programs, but our business services teams do put on uh, county-wide, regional-wide um, uh, job fairs and so forth so that we can source talent, not just from who we're working with, but uh, the population at large. And so that includes uh, filling vacancies within MCPS and helping to address their particular staffing needs, teachers and psychologists and, and those sort of things? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. But specifically, we, I know that there's been at least one job fair last fall with MCPS as like one of the major partners so we can, you know, so we can bring in county residents and our clients to access those jobs. And I believe that there's another one um, uh, planned for the spring. That's great. I look forward to, to learning more about that because that is a huge area of concern and of need. Thank you. Next, uh, Council Member Albornoz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I first want to thank both chairs for organizing this session. This was a really good idea. Mm -hmm. And I know Council Member Fanny Gonzalez has been talking about this. Um, and so this, for me, highlights we have individual programs that are helping to address this issue, but it seems clear to me we need a sort of a systemic change. Um, and as Brad mentioned, you know, 15 years ago, other states were thinking ahead aggressively uh, and how to plan for the future. And while, again, we have great initiatives here and there that are producing results, um, I, I do think we need a systemic change. And I'd, I'd like to humbly request that we have a phase two and bring in our university partners, universities of Shady Grove and Montgomery College, to have sort of the part two of this conversation and see what we're doing. It's great. Thank you. And I apologize for being late, so you probably covered that this morning. Um, so I do have sort of a, a few points and a couple of questions. Um, one is that uh, one asset we do have here in Montgomery County, uh, more so than other jurisdictions, is many of our students speak a second language, uh, or in some cases a third. And so it would be interesting moving forward to track industries and jobs that place a premium on students that do have the ability to seek a second language. And it's not part of the charts or graphs yet, um, but my first job out of college I got because I spoke Spanish fluently. 
Um, and so it is an asset that I think we should upsell uh, to uh, different corporations and companies who are looking to relocate here and something we should highlight more as an asset that we already have right here in front of us. The second thing that struck me in your presentation were the soft skills. Um, with, and I agree, soft is not the appropriate term because these are skills that uh, any employer in any industry is looking for in employees. And that is an area that I know MCPS has been working in addition to many um, and in trying to develop those communication, those leadership skills. And it, it reminded me of an initiative that Wheaton High School had five or six years ago. And I was a judge, that's why I remember the program. But uh, Wheaton partnered with several companies um, and, and industries and put together through their junior and senior class uh, groups of kids that learned in groups and in clusters and developed projects that they then presented to the corresponding companies. And I was one of the judges that judged um, those, those projects. But it was a win-win because it helped develop those skills, those soft skills, but it also, uh, in a very tangible way, connected those students to employers who were looking for jobs in high growth areas right now. And our school system, as we will soon hear, I know struggles uh, in being able to implement the very complex curriculum that is often dictated to us. It's not something that we necessarily control here. Um, but the partnership with the Kid Museum and other initiatives to enhance some of the existing services are what I think we need to double and triple down on. Um, and the challenge with an effort like this is it doesn't fall specifically in any one category of government. Uh, it crosses over into multi-sections. And so I think there does need to be sort of a comprehensive strategic plan that is going to have to live somewhere but owned by all of us. Um, and I also think we will need to look at making aggressive investments through the budget process and see what assets and do an asset map of, of what already is out there and see how we can expand it. So um, I did have just a couple of questions. and. and um, while, again, great things have happened, we haven't stayed dormant these last 15 years. If you do look ahead, I know AI uh, is an area of significant growth as one of probably many examples. But um, what are you foreseeing over the next 5, 10, 15 years in addition to the needs of businesses right now? So I, I think for us, um, we, we have had a lot of conversations about AI. And I think they were just generated by us using more AI tools our, ourselves. Um, but we, we, we saw it in our data. There are a lot of specialized skills, um, top specialized skills that employers are looking for now and tomorrow based on the data that we pulled that are, that are all tech-based or, or tech-related. Um, and I think we... Um, we've seen that with the allocation of our resources for training that, um, that there's been a major focus on that as far as interest from our residents or job seekers and, and where our, our training resources are going. So, you know, I, I think, you know, we'll continue to focus on, on cyber and all of the aspects of, of information technology and what we do in creating smart partnerships um, so that we can, you know, adequately, adequately prepare residents for those, those jobs. I think one thing that's also... Um, a huge area of, of opportunity to is to expand apprenticeship opportunities within those tech sectors. You don't always need to have a, uh, a four-year degree to get started. So that's one thing that we're also heavily focused on is, is figuring out um, what are the apprenticeable occupations and entry points so that we can work with Maryland Department of Labor and intermediaries so that uh, when you think apprenticeship in Montgomery County, it's not just the building trades. Um, it's equally accessible when it comes to medical fields in, in IT, but happy to either one of you to add on to that. I worry sometimes that we train CDO drivers for a job that's not going to be there in five years. But we need it now. I worry that... Um, that many of the entry-level jobs, despite the industry, are going to go away. And I can't, I can't give you my crystal ball, but when we sit and talk to like with the National Association of Workforce Boards and they bring in, they call people they call futurists, which makes me snicker a little, mm -hmm. frankly. 
But they talk about these massive changes that are coming for our workforce, and I see them as almost having crosshairs right at kind of that lower skilled, possibly more manual labor-ish kind of areas where people just, like our first jobs, right? I didn't come fully formed as Anthony's deputy director, right? There was a lot of stuff in between. And I'm really very, very concerned about many of those opportunities for our residents and, 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 and folks everywhere to, to, to start their careers and be able to get that attachment to the labor force, get that attachment to an industry. My stepson works for Microsoft, and he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room, and he probably is when you're on the room. <laughs> but he tells me that, you know, his opinion, this is his opinion, there's no data on this, but his opinion is that if you don't have a tech background in 15, 20 years, you're going to have a hard time having a job unless you're in human services, healthcare, and some of these other fields. Um, so we worry about that a great deal. But we have to workforce. Not EDC. I think EDC's got their vision is wider out on the horizon. But our charge is to take care of the business owners and the residents in and, and the economy that we have today. Understanding those changes are coming, try to prepare ourselves for those, but make sure that we're serving the needs of the community today and the needs of the clients and the businesses today. It's it's a balancing act and it's but if you sit back and you think about it, we have maybe 15 people in CDL training right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that's a job that's going to be around in two years. And I worry about that, because then what? Then we go, then they're back in the public workforce system, or we're trying to find them another job that they're going to be attached to, right? So it, you ask a very hard question, and I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. Not a group one, anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your honesty, John. And I'll just end with this thought. Um, and, and just, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Fred. Thank you, Councilmember Albanos. Can I, can I add one comment or to the comment you made? Um, diversity is a huge uh, attraction for Montgomery County. Um, and that's something we put a lot of effort into in ensuring all the companies that are interested in coming here understand how, how diverse our workforce is, um, the number of different people, skill sets, and cultures they'll have access to. It hasn't necessarily focused on language or other skills, but it does in some ways. It's interesting to me. I've spent most of my life working for international companies. And uh, if you just look at a map, it makes it's the logic would be that most of those companies would be European, Central South American, just purely from physical physical distance and time difference, right? Just the things that make sense. Um, we've done work around our strategic industries. If you look at um, life sciences, again, as an example, uh, we have a large number of non US companies whose US headquarters are here in Montgomery County. They've chosen out of all the the entire United States to headquarter here. And they're about 50% Asian and 50% uh, European. So it's, even though you have these assumptions, the reality is actually very different. And part of it is they can find large groups of people that share their culture, share their language, make them feel comfortable, welcome, and at home. And I think that's a really incredible barrier to knock down for people coming to a, a completely different country, right? To have access to something familiar to them. Uh, to answer your other question uh, from a strategic perspective, um, I look at 10 or 15 years from now what jobs are likely to still be here because they can't go somewhere else, right? And they're still going to exist. We're always going to have government jobs here, right? We have a sh the federal government is our essentially our largest employer in Montgomery County. Most of those jobs are going to stay here. They're going to change. We're always at risk of losing them. Um, the government right now, I can tell you, is going through a large process of trying to understand how they rationalize office space, and we've all seen the impact and still don't know under, how to understand it of remote working, right? People who are technically employed by a company here but living somewhere far away. We see that everywhere. Across the country, people don't understand how to deal with that yet. Um, but the government is going to stay here. Um, our life sciences, most of those life sciences companies are going to stay here. The reason is they've put hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, into capital expenditures to be here and built facilities that are impossible to move, right? So those sort of things are sticky, and, and those are the, I think those sticky things are what we need more of. Um, we have a lot of corporate headquarters here, which are, are difficult or challenging for companies to move. Healthcare is needed everywhere, right? And we, we clearly have an under, um, 
uh, we have too few healthcare workers today. That happens everywhere in the U.S., but it's a huge opportunity, right? Nursing is always in short supply, physicians and everything else, and they welcome anyone who's willing to do the job. Uh, so I think it's thinking about what are these big, sticky things that we can do a better job at, because if we're just being honest, uh, if I'm doing IT work, I can do that anywhere. I don't have to just be here or in Tyson's. I can be in somewhere in Asia or anywhere else. Um, and there's some structural barriers, right? If you're doing fe uh, federal cybersecurity, just proximity to places like NSA is just, that's probably not something we're going to change. But that would be sort of an overarching thing to think about. I appreciate that. I know we, we've uh, we've still got another presentation and a couple more colleagues who are in the queue. I'll just end with these last two thoughts. The first to underscore your first point, one of the faster growing sports in Montgomery County is cricket. <laughs> Um, because many of those employees that you mentioned that are coming from other parts of the world, um, which is great, it's beautiful, uh, which I think is, a, is an asset. And I'll, I'll end where you finished as well, which is um, underscoring, you know, as chair of HHS, we hear constantly from our health care providers, particularly our hospitals, uh, who are coming forward with another ask because they can't hire nurses. And so they're having to hire these traveling nurses that cost four times as much to be able to uh, sustain their operating budgets. So that is another area of emphasis that I'd love to follow up on, too. So with that, I yield back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, President Glass. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good conversation. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll be brief in my, my thoughts because I know we have another panel and a lot of my questions were asked by, by colleagues. But there's the comment about CDLs, right? Um, I used to have a CDL. I actually drove uh, uh, a school bus for a summer camp at a period of time. But the point that you, you made um, is also similar. I, I used to do work in Memphis with Memphis uh, City Schools. Uh, and there was a conversation back then about a cobbler program that they had. This is in 2011, and the utility of teaching people to fix shoes when nearly everyone's just going to DS, DSW or somewhere else and they're not fixing their shoes. And so I understand that. But the bigger question I think that we have to tackle is finding jobs for people today while training them for the jobs of tomorrow. And the training that needs to go in and the foresight that needs to be provided, not only in the private sector but clearly in the government sector, we need those investments but we also need people to have jobs today so they're not sitting idly at home or on wherever else they might be uh, because we know what idle hands often end up doing. And here in Montgomery County, where we have the fourth largest biohealth hub in the country, uh, and many of the companies that are coming here, if they're not small startups, they are international conglomerates that are putting their American footprint here in our community. Many of those are European, they're Asian, and I would argue that as we look for or are optimistic on building upon those successes, that we add language training, right, opportunities into the mix. But again, the rub is taking the time to train somebody in another language so they could be uh, part of the global economy, which we are building out here in Montgomery County, um, takes them away from doing stuff today that they need for their paycheck and their own livelihood. And so I think it's something that we have to wrestle with. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily just uh, within your organizations, but it's meeting the, day, the, com the demands of today versus the needs of tomorrow. And, and that is a balance that we have to find the right uh, structure for. Um, and, and I'll just close on this regarding structure. I applaud WorkSource for the structural changes that have been underway, um, namely since uh, Mr. Featherstone has come on board recognizing the evolution, uh, recognizing where we need to go, recognizing the makeup not only of our residents but of the business community and those who we're serving. And so I appreciate you sharing those updates with us and the changes with the committees and, and, and the board structure. Look forward to continuing to have more of those conversations on this very excellent joint committee. Um, and I do appreciate the chairs for, for organizing this conversation. A lot more to do. The data is 
important and what will inform us. Um, but I look forward to more conversations. So thank you. Council Member Sales. Thank you. There's, there's no light. <laughs> so um, thank you all for coming and uh, sharing some stats with us about uh, the progress you're making in workforce development. I fondly recall right before the campaign, we took a tour to uh, Prince George's County. Were you with us, Mr. Feverson? Yes. So we were looking at uh, workforce development opportunities in the building trades and all the programs that Prince George's County has underway where their students are taking full advantage of those programs. And um, as someone who also benefited from you know, those programs as a pharmacy technician, my daughter was able to also graduate college and career ready so she could work as um, a certified nursing assistant uh, all throughout her college career and especially helpful during the pandemic when those jobs were in demand. Um, so I wanted to talk with you a bit more about the uh, WorkSource Montgomery's um, metrics that uh, you're using to measure the success of WorkSource Montgomery and how you measure success, what that looks like to you. I know you have a is it a four-year plan that WorkSource Montgomery develops? And so can you share a bit about how you measure success and what the next four years or when the next plan will be available for you? Thank you? Sure. So the next plan will be released uh, right around late spring of 2024 um, <clears throat> and in that plan we'll do another dive into what the um, target industries are and what the labor market growth and projections look like um, as well as what our strategy is to uh, to meet the, the workforce needs based on that that information um, as far as how we um, I think measure success there, there are different metrics and measures within each one of those priorities that we review um, I think you know, ultimately, it leads to the, the core measures of employment, wages, and retention and advancement <clears throat> that we track um, both federally and, and non-federally with, with both levels of, of those programs. Um, we also uh, get feedback from employers on our services, good and bad, um, so we can, you know, figure out what are the, the course corrections that we may need, may need to make as far as our offerings um, and how we uh, provide or deliver services to local employers. But um, you know, though, though, those are our, our, our top level measures. Um, we, we have a, a goal of 100% employment uh, and retention, of course, um, but we try not to uh, ever dip below 70 plus percent when it comes to folks who come through our doors, no matter which program they, they enter um, and leave out of our doors um, in the status of being employed uh, with, with next steps beyond that employment that they're in right now. So are those uh, 100 percent, 70 to 100 percent rates consistent with the 12-month uh, evaluations you do to check in? Yes. Is that how you're getting? Okay. Thank you. And then I had another question about um, the long-term projection for the amount of money that uh, WorkSource Montgomery spends uh, compared to the anticipated wage increases of individuals that have gone through the program? Have you seen any significant increases from people that have gone through your program? Any changes? Do you track that data? So people who start, whether it's through the WIOA, um, WIOA, yes. <laughs> people who, <laughs> so people who come through programs like that, the unemployment program, the uh, biomedical program, are you tracking their um, salaries prior to engaging in our programs and after? Yes, and and those reports are coming back in the form of uh, uh, our monitoring reports from the state, where they track median wages. They have benchmarks. We traditional we traditionally in Montgomery County um, outperform our benchmark in the median wage uh, standard set by the Maryland Department of Labor. 
without any difficulty and and and, um, and consistently and, and and by a lot. I mean, I don't have the percentage of how much we beat it in my head, but that's our median wage and and starting wage is median wage because of where we are, where we you know where we live and where we work. Uh, those wages aren't an issue um, as it relates to how we're evaluated by the state. Okay. And is that something that will be included in the? Uh four-year report, or is there an annual report that tracks those sorts of gains? I, we certainly can share the, 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 the state valuation report that we give on a quarterly basis that has the median wages. Mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to how we attack that in the, in the four-year plan, um, the, the, the local plan charts our path as it relates to the services we deliver here in the county. Um, and some of what informs that is things around what industries are important and what those wages look like. And so those, the wage information is embedded in the thinking and the um, strategies that are put forth in the plan. And it's due up in 26, 24. Do you track which jobs are obtained through our small minority and women-owned businesses versus our bigger corporations? Because we always hear that, you know, small businesses are the backbone of our economy, and I'm just wondering if we're also engaging those businesses as we're thinking about employment opportunities. We are engaging those businesses. I don't have a percentage for you at this point. Okay. All right. And then... Um, a few more questions, Madam Chair. Um, how is uh, Montgomery County compared to other nearby jurisdictions on the pandemic recovery? So we haven't uh, achieved pre-pandemic labor force numbers. I think we are still down. Uh, no, we're up about 5,000 jobs from the from we're down about 24,000 jobs from pre-pandemic. Yeah. yeah, so we're we're still down a bit from pre pre-pandemic labor labor force levels, and I think you you see that same trend across the employment and unemployment um, numbers. Um, I, I think we uh, compare relatively uh, similar to uh, like-sized jurisdictions. We usually compare to Prince George's, um, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Anne Arundel when we talk about our workforce area um, comparison. Um, so some are a little, you know, north, some are a little south, but we, we haven't achieved pre-pandemic labor force levels. And I think that's <clears throat> one of the uh, big reasons that we've uh, really engaged in this community impact and outreach um, effort to, to pull more folks into the labor force so that we can um, do our part to try to increase those, those numbers. It would be good to compare regional-wise with D.C. and Virginia because, you know, that's who we're competing with. At this, at this moment. Um, and I have one last question. Um, with the county's Economic Development Corporation, um, we met with uh, Chair uh, Bill Tompkins earlier this year, um, along with the county executives, uh, financial staff. And we noticed that a lot of the jobs that are being filled are low-level, low-wage jobs. And so I just wanted to know what you are, um, I believe we're getting a strategic, yeah, so we're gonna have a meeting soon to discuss the strategic vision of how we are not just attracting, but also connecting these good-paying jobs to our school system so that the schools are adequately preparing the workforce. And I don't know if you can add anything to that. I can add some questions probably for your next panel, not today, but in the future. Okay. So um, it, there are challenges. There's so many different organizations within Montgomery County and the state that are interested in trying to do these things. And as Anthony mentioned, they do a great job of trying to partner with everybody and get everybody rolling in the same direction. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge because employers get reached out to by 70 different people asking 70 different things and they don't know who to pay attention to or actually have something happen as a result of that. So uh, a couple of things have been going on. Uh, when uh, last year the council funded the Ready Institute at the University of Shady Grove, 
uh, and they're standing up that program now to really do uh, a job of pulling together that sort of strategy aligned to educational pathways uh, with MCPS, Montgomery College, and USG. So I think Dr. Kadamian would be a great person to, to speak to their efforts there. It's been a few months, so they're at least underway. Anthony mentioned their um, workforce boards that are focused on industries now that help to provide feedback and input. And certainly our point of view is the companies that we deal with and trying to help. Uh, we frequently pull Workforce Montgomery in when we have a new company moving in trying to help attract talent. Um, so I, we try to do the best we can of pulling together a lot of disparate groups. Um, and then the uh, recently in December, Montgomery County Economic Development had a, we've been working on a memorandum of understanding with Workforce Montgomery, MCPS, USG, Montgomery College, and had a meeting in December to sit down and talk about how we could help better coordinate some of this outreach and make it more effective and with fewer touch points to get uh, better information. So. Sounds very promising, and I look forward to seeing the results of the MOU. Thank you all. Great questions. I uh, just want to highlight that uh, recently the County Council had um, a session with the Planning Department, and uh, it was highlighted to us that the 2244 H cohort in the county is declining. Um, so the fact that we need to ensure that our young folks are ready, starting from kindergarten, to ensure that they have those math scores and literacy scores really strong so they can get into middle school and having already a strong back, a strong base is critical for the future. So with that, we're, we're going to thank you for being here and look forward to seeing you again in a future work session. And we welcome our friends from MCPS for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think we have Elaine Chang, Arena LaGrange. Dr. Genevieve Floyd, if she's, I see you here. Sean Kresa and Steve Bowden. And anyone else you want to bring that fits. Thank you. And Mr. Featherstone thank, and, and team, you'll be back for the next panel because you're in part of everything. You know, as far as when we do Montgomery College, not next panel, but next yeah. session. session. Uh, so, get get comfortable. And okay, yeah. Well, and good morning to everybody. I, I wanted to mention. Uh, I don't want to cut off our our great team of colleagues here, but it's a really important uh, point that Councilmember Alvernos brought up, and that we had a discussion that kind of continuing. And, and I learned something new about Council President Glass today as a as a, 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 a CDL driver, um, and uh, so which is really cool, and and also I, I was hoping you meant like apple cobblers and you know like baking, but yeah, I know what you, you meant foot, um, but that I think we have to have both preparation for the jobs of today, and that was brought up, and we do that at MCPS too, but also uh, a vision for pathways of the jobs of tomorrow. Uh, to the extent that we can f future cast that um, because we have needs for both and, and you know if I think about any job I've ever had you know the things that are now irrelevant it led to something else the skills that I learned there mattered and it transferred in some way to some future job um, and so I think there's some some benefit there um, and as we transition to the MCPS discussion you all are at the, the middle of every all of this because we're trying to respond to the current needs of the workforce, but also have our students be prepared, college and career ready uh, when they when they leave. Um, and you all know how how important that work is and how important it is to us. And work based learning in, in in particular is how it's important to is this to me. Um, and uh, I have four children, but if I had another baby, it would be summer rise. Um, and. And uh, me, me and me and Elaine affectionately call ourselves the mom and dad of, uh, of, of Summer Rise. And, and it's one example of what needs to be, and what we'll talk about today, a long-term broad vision to have every student in MCPS ladder up to a work-based learning opportunity at some point in their career. Um, and we don't, we're not there yet, um, but 
it's, it's going to be critical. So I, I really want to say that. I think that's a goal that I'm sure my colleagues share, you know, that we have, by the time every student gets to high school, you know, our 50,000 high school students, they all have access to a work-based learning opportunity and that they've been prepared in elementary and middle. They've got their mind going. They've done the career days. They've done the other things that you're doing to get them in the moment where they will experience that. And, and that's where we need to get there. Um, and that's so tied to making sure we have folks to fill the jobs for today and tomorrow. So um, really appreciate you all being here, and I'll turn it over to to you to start the presentation. Good morning. My name is Kristen Juan Calisto. I am the Executive Director in the Office of the Chief of Staff. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Dr. McKnight and our senior leaders because um, they also share your concern around how we're doing in math and literacy and currently are in a work session with our board discussing um, proposals for the fiscal year 24 operating budget because we can't uh, move forward with uh, closing those gaps unless we're actually resourcing them. Uh, so that's where they are right now. Uh, I also stand before you as hopefully next Thursday uh, a new resident of Montgomery County. Um, <laughs> and I will say that uh, housing costs are a factor, um, having just relocated from Washington State, um, where I own a house there as well. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that as someone who has lived and worked uh, in education in five different states, um, in coming to Montgomery County five months ago, uh, I've been really impressed already in the short time that I've been here with the involvement of council members as well as our business community in being able to support the work that you're about to hear. Um, I know that there are more opportunities for growth uh, and that's what we're here to talk about. But I also want to acknowledge that, comparatively speaking, from some of the other places that I've most recently come from, I started my teaching career in Hawaii, I come to you from Washington State, um, it's pretty remarkable uh, where Montgomery County is starting from, and it offers us a great launch point to continue forward. So I will let my colleagues introduce themselves, and they will get into the presentation. Nice to meet you. I don't think we've had you here before. so. I don't think you've been before the committee, so nice to meet you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Irina Lagrange. I am the Director of College and Career Readiness and District-wide Programs. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I would like for the team to introduce for my team to introduce themselves before we begin. Good morning, Sean Kraza, Supervisor for Work-Based Learning. I have the opportunity to supervise internship and apprenticeship opportunities for the district. And prior to being in this role at Central Office, I had the opportunity to be principal at Thomas Edison High School of Technology. And so I had the opportunity to see firsthand our students access career training, career certification, and then engage directly with employers. And so having had that opportunity and opened the brand new state-of-the-art facility, um, it led me to this current role and realization like what we're doing at Edison, we need to do that for all our students across the district. So it's really exciting work uh, to be engaged with and thank you for allowing me to join today. Good morning, Genevieve Floyd, and I supervise career and post-secondary partnerships. And under that umbrella are a variety of programs, activities, projects, and initiatives that include programs such as our career and technical education programs, a variety of those, and our dual enrollment programs as well. So I'm thrilled to be here and be a part of this conversation. Good morning, Steve Bowden. I'm with Montgomery County Schools, and I supervise the Foundations Office and also uh, many career and technical programs within MCPS. We have four nonprofit educational foundations that engage our business partners, and we also um, Oversee, I also oversee the Montgomery County Collaboration Board. Looking forward to sharing more about that with you soon. Good morning. I'm Elaine Chang. I'm the Director of the Department of Partnerships for Montgomery County Public Schools, former teacher, former principal. Um, my office is the one that, when in doubt and you want to partner with our school system, come my way and I help figure it out. So my partners are not just business, but nonprofit, faith based, government agencies, higher ed. Uh, wear a lot of hats, a lot of topics K 12, K 16. Um, I'm a single parent of Summarize now, and that's what I'm, I'm going to be talking to you about today. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, team. 
So this morning, our goal is to share with you an overview of our work-based learning programs, which provide our students with hands-on experiences to gauge in the workforce. And so today, we will share with you some data and background on our apprenticeship programs, internships, uh, work site-based learning experiences, of course, some arise and career experiences that um, stretch over K through 12. In terms of work-based learning, it's important to consider this within the context of the blueprint legislation, uh, which expects that by 2030, 45% of the students in the state will graduate with industry-recognized credentials. And along with that, um, of course, Montgomery County's Board of Education plan that expects that by 2025, 25% of our students will graduate with work-based learning experiences. It's also important to note that MCPS vision is that 100% of our students will graduate with college and career um, community readiness, which again has us look at our um, work-based learning um, in terms of ensuring awareness to our students in K through 12 to the multitude of programs that are available to them and really engaging them in exploration, creating opportunities that will prepare them for college and careers and really engaging them through culturally relevant instruction that's both engaging and rigorous. Um, and so right now I will turn it over to my colleague. Son, go ahead so we can speak to the apprentices. So in MCPS, our vision with the work-based learning continuum is that students beginning in kindergarten to career have multiple and different types of experiences over time, whether that be a job shadow or a career day in elementary or middle school. And then as we get into high school, that's where we're getting very close to the graduation. And students in grade 11 and 12 have opportunities to actually go out and work directly for employers. So Apprenticeship is one method that they can do that, internship, and then also site-based work experience, along with Summer Rise. So when we take a look at our apprenticeship, in theory, students have the opportunity to work 450 hours for an employer. The employer identifies what type of training and certification that apprentice would need to complete. And so in our development, of the apprenticeship program, we started to engage with different employers and we had to have a framework in how we approach that. And oftentimes when apprenticeship is new to an employer, we begin with a pilot. And so where we started, this was right around the post pandemic when we were all virtual. We had to place some of our apprenticeship work that we had initially started with employers on hold because a lot of employers when it comes to apprenticeship they preferred the in-person learning. They needed the students at the job site to work. And so when we were in that virtual year, we developed a electrical pre-apprenticeship opportunity with IEC Chesapeake. Um, they have 150 electrical contractor members that had an interest and a need to hire students to go into a career in electricity. So we started with a pilot and oftentimes I've found that employers with registered apprenticeships already set up, when it comes to engaging with students at the high school level, they feel pre-apprenticeship is a good starting or an entry point. So we created a 200-hour pre-electrical apprenticeship program at IEC Chesapeake. That was our entry point. We piloted that. We had a grant for transportation to get students to and from IEC. And uh, we had nine students from various different high schools access that opportunity. And then in our transition in next year, this was what set the stage for really a great framework and almost the gold standard is the school to apprenticeship where students can begin the first year of their registered apprenticeship training while they're a senior in high school. So in year two of having students in apprenticeship, we had two students that were able to begin year one of their electrical journeyman while they're a senior in high school. Traditionally, uh, employers would require students to have a high school diploma or GED to be able to access this type of opportunity. But as we continue to grow the program, we currently have six students in that electrical school to apprenticeship program this year. And we partnered with our neighboring districts. So Prince George's County, Howard County, Anne Arundel County, our four districts came together and we have a class of 18 students. Six of those students are from MCPS. 
and we recognized that during National Apprenticeship Week. We had an opportunity to highlight that. And then also, MCPS, we've talked about Maryland Blueprint and Grow Your Own. And so MCPS, being one of the largest employers in Montgomery County, we had to create a process and pilot a model of how that would work. How would we hire a high school student uh, to work as apprentice while also being a student? And so we worked directly with our print shop to hire, well, to design what that would look like in human resources. How would we actually do that? And so at this point in time, we have three students that are MCPS apprentices. Half of their day, they're a student. The other half of their day, they're an MCPS employee. And I have to say, I, I mentioned before uh, in my introduction that I had an opportunity to be principal at Edison. Well, at the middle of the school year, right here at the start of the second semester, we had a student at Wheaton High School that went to Edison to do network operations. He earned his CompTIA certification. The print shop had a copier maintenance technician apprenticeship position. And having had this training, having had earned this certification, the student said, I'm an MCPS senior, I earned this certification, I want to interview for this opportunity. And uh, the student is working as an MCPS, uh, MCPS apprentice, and he wants to graduate and continue working for MCPS after graduation. So it's exciting to be able to see that. And, and rewarding too as an educator to know that the work and the time we put into students in our programming, it, it benefits them in opportunity. So that has been our, our starting and entry point. And then also as we've been building the electrical apprenticeship, uh, we've had seniors learn about the opportunity to become an electrician and say, well, it's you know December, January, I really have an interest in doing this. Is there a way for me to do this? And so that's where in collaboration with uh, IEC Chesapeake and WorkSource Montgomery, we were able to introduce the pre-apprenticeship um, program again. And uh, the funding needed to be able to support the tuition and the training for the student was supported by WorkSource Montgomery. So it's been a great partnership in that sense. So in addition to MCPS and IEC Chesapeake, we have had other employers in the construction trades area that have hired students to be apprentices. Um, as we continue to move forward and talk with students, we're learning too that students have an interest in other career fields, medical, computer science, um, and we know that we need to build our portfolio of opportunities. Construction is often the go-to because they have a good working model and they've been doing it for a number of years. And so they're the easiest employer to transition and onboard. When it comes to other employers, we've started to network and connect with other areas. Um, we will have our first medical apprenticeship as a dental assistant. Um, so in March, we have uh, an employer that's going to get approved with Maryland Department of Labor to be an apprenticeship sponsor. And uh, they'll have capacity to train 20 dental assistants a year. And so part of our work is engaging with the employer to create the framework for how students in high school will be able to get this training opportunity. And then the other part is, okay, how do we train our counselors and our internship coordinators at each high school to communicate these opportunities that students are able to access? So it, it's, apprenticeship is a great entry point opportunity for the employer to begin training future workforce. And then at the same time, it's a great way for students to get into a career. And so apprenticeship continues to grow and evolve. Um, and, and we're excited at, in some of the new prospects that we have for employers. When you go to the next slide, you can see statewide, um, the Apprenticeship Maryland program was piloted in Frederick and Washington County, and they had two years to pilot the program, see how it worked, give feedback to MSDE and Maryland Department of Labor. And when you look at where we currently are, which is about seven years later, we, um, are in similar position to some of the other districts in the state and um, just in kind of learning from our neighbors uh, Anne Arundel actually partnered with NSA and they had capacity to hire 125 apprentices 
And so that's where, you know, having opportunity to learn from and network and share best practices from other districts is very helpful and is valuable in our work as well because in some cases, some employers do operate in multiple counties. And so we may be sharing employers and opportunities. So that gives you the current state of the statewide apprenticeship as far as how many students are accessing it by county. When you go to our internship and site-based work experience program, in internship, we've been averaging about 1,500 students per year accessing an internship. There are two ways they can get credit for it. They can be going through a CTE, a career and technical education program of study, and choose to do an internship with an employer to complete that pathway and earn that credit for graduation. Or they can choose to take that internship experience as an elective. And what I've learned in talking with students is oftentimes when students access an internship, they're doing so for two reasons. One, they want to build their resume. And two, they have an interest in getting a letter of recommendation for their college application. And so it's really exciting to see that we have students doing internships in all of the different industries. And um, when we look at site-based work experience, that is a two-year CTE program of study where junior year students work with a teacher. They do research on different careers. They learn about industry certifications. And then senior year, they actually get a job for an employer and start working. And so these are great opportunities. And something else, too, we've learned in internship is that a number of our students in Montgomery County use the network, the social capital, if you will, that they have in place. They have a family member, friend of the family, a neighbor that is in a career field that easily sets them up for an internship at NIH or Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in one of these biotech firms. Part of our work moving forward is building our employer portfolio and setting the stage for students that do not have the social capital to navigate the system. And hold on one second for me, because council, the camera coach here wants to make a quick. That sounds great. But you know, the big problem that I have with your comments is that when you're talking about this social network, and talking about, you know, my family member, my, my, my neighbor, my father can connect me to that job. You're talking about white people. You're not talking about the majority of people who live in this county, people of color who don't have the, you know, the, the we don't have the, the same background or, or the same connections that other populations have had for generations. I need this committee to really talk about the needs that we have, the social challenges that we have, and, and what efforts are we having to ensure that every single child, starting from you know, the, the, the first day that they arrived to Montgomery County Public Schools, have opportunities and have the resources that they need to succeed and have those math and literacy scores increase so they can have those connections and, and get into that demographic that you're talking about. And I, I, I think you were getting to the point of like that's good for them, but not. It, we need to build that capacity so that we're not relying on that. I'm sure, I know that was a goal in Summerize. That was a big push. It's a goal in all your programs. So go ahead. But yeah, so, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to add and respond to that, um, in MCPS we researched how other school districts are expanding their work-based learning programs. And a common practice is a web-based platform that allows each school district to monitor student progress in their work-based learning experience, as well as post opportunities that students are able to review and explore and see if they have an interest in applying for. And so uh, last year we piloted a platform. We got feedback from our internship coordinators at each high school. Uh, we made some adjustments, went with a different vendor that would be a better fit for Montgomery County. So this year we have 20 of our 25 high schools beginning to use X2 Ball. Next year when we go into um, the 23-24 school year, the expectation will be that every high school is using this web-based, work-based learning platform to 
manage work-based learning opportunities and also post opportunities. So when we talk about employer engagement, it's easier for us as a district to engage with employer that has multiple locations that students could access and place it in a platform where students can see. So instead of having 25 high schools contact, let's say, Starbucks um, or CVS for like a pharmacy tech opportunity, um, we can place this in the platform, students can see it, and they can begin applying. And that's where our internship coordinators work with students to develop their resume, practice interview skills, um, check on them, do site visits, work with their supervisor throughout their experience. So we have a staff member at each high school that is able to work directly with students to help prepare them for the experience, help them research, because that's a life skill in itself too, learning how to research and locate what opportunities are available. And so we, as we continue to move forward, we want to be able to change that and provide support and access for all of our students so that they can get a career experience uh, and build their resume, build their portfolio as they advance in their career. Thank you. How many more slides do you have in the presentation? Just curious. I know we got to get to the I just want to, I'm just trying to be conscious of time here. Two more. Okay, good. Go ahead. Thank you. You're up. Okay. Uh, feel free to cut me off. Um, from the inception of the startup summarized from uh, 2017, uh, Council Member Jawando and the help of other council members who adopted the in 2019, we have had more than 2,000 other students participate. Um, oh, I, let me let me take a step back. I'm, I apologize and thank you for this time to be here. Um, Summarize is a summer program. It is free for rising high school juniors and seniors. Um, this year it's going to be five weeks and 50 hours. In the past it's been 60 hours or four weeks. We've, we've played with it um, from feedback from students, from feedback from hosts, um, feedback from parents. Uh, um, it is a program where high school junior, rising high school juniors and seniors in MCPS, uh, we've had some other kids try to get in, we don't have capacity for that, to learn about a career from an actual real live employer. Um, uh, you'll see up here on the slide that 459 unique employers have participated. That means that uh, an employer such as MCPS, it might have been 20 different departments or offices. Montgomery College might have different departments. Um, auto a department, meanwhile, you know, a biochemical chemi department, whoever, whoever wants to host in that given year. Um, and we have made a point ever since 2017 to make sure students in every high school get in, including our special, uh, special ed high schools. Um, uh, starting in 2021, behind the scenes, I don't make this public, although it's a county council meeting, um, I make sure that all of the students living in poverty have an opportunity, so they have an opportunity to turn me down versus them not getting in at all. Um, on the back end, people don't know this, but um, you get in blind, and then on the back end, I look at your, your IEP or your 504 accommodation, and then I make it happen in terms of the, the support that you need, so I do that blind, and then I figure out my staffing. Um, my team uh, has started targeted outreach to schools, specifically schools that are higher poverty and don't have as much enrollment. We are actually uh, in the schools meeting with kids and we're seeing enrollment numbers go up. Um, now that we're coming out of COVID, we are also doing parent and student information sessions. Um, if you were to attend the other night, it was majority, uh, minority majority. I'm proud to say that 85% of the students that participated in Summarize in 2022 were minorities. 15% were um, Caucasian. Uh, and included in the minority number, I am including Asians, which sometimes people define that differently, um, and two or more races. Um, the point of Summarize is to help inform life after high school, so it's a, it's a great added hands-on real-world experience to inform what do you want to do after high school, when council member Juano and I ran uh, Summarize, there's a student that wanted to be a nurse. We put her with a nursing opportunity. She said after that, I am not going to be a nurse. Um, which is great because it informs the next step and we know that a lot of students actually waste money going to college for a degree that they don't use. Um, again, we have process improved every year. We, uh, we have changed how we match students behind the scenes. We don't use a um, computer formula anymore. We actually hand match and we got smarter with how we match students. So 
rather than saying, uh, making the assumption that they can get there within a certain miles, we actually say during the summer, during these months, where can you get to? Tell us the areas of Montgomery County or other areas you can get to. Okay, you can get to Poolsville, Damascus, and Gaithersburg. We then look at what, what kind of careers do you want to pursue? Do you want to be a dentist, but you also want to be a biochemist, but you also might want to be a teacher? And then we look at the opportunities that we have in each area, and then we match. We also have gone so far as to ask employers, um, what languages would you like multilingual employees to have? What kind of skill sets? We also have conversations with employers and students. Are you currently in one of our program of studies along our 60 or 50 some industrial pathways? And then we ask employers, do you want a student that's in that pathway or not in that pathway? We also track ACEs and college tracks and other programs um, that are helping students behind the scenes to make sure, actually I prioritize ACEs, college tracks, collegiate directions, superintendents, leadership academy students all get into the program first. Um, I think I'm ready to go to my next slide. Oh, um, so I just wanted to share that in 2022, 82% of the hosts were actually non-MCPS hosts, 57% of them being business, including nonprofit in that number. 18% were county government, thanks to many of your offices and uh, uh, the county executives departments. 18% um, were Montgomery County Public School offices and 4% were higher ed. For my next slide, um, I did wanna share a couple of um, quick, quick stories that uh, Council Member Jawando will appreciate. One of the 2017 fire rescue students sent us an email, said that she, I'm probably gonna tear up, she graduated summa cum laude and she's off to medical school. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to tear up, but I, I'm a crier all the time. Um, I had a high functioning Asperger's student reach out and ask me for a recommendation and we had an African American female who was matched with Montgomery County Police. Baltimore City or Baltimore County, can't remember which one, called her office recently and said that she was applying for a job to be a police officer. Uh, and could we recommend and confirm that she participated in Summer Rise. So those are like my, my just it warms my heart. This is a passion project for my office. Um, host registration opened up December 1. We already have 66 hosts. Um, um, 12 of them are brand new, representing IT, medi med medicine, engineering, justice and law, advertising and marketing. We need help to get more hosts. Um, we have spread Summer Rise since its inception um, and actually thanks to the virtual environment. So. We actually allow virtual still and hybrid and also live, and that's how we were able to spread hosts out to DC, Prince George's County, Frederick County, Baltimore City, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Um, uh, one of my students taught me about um, transportation. She was placed in my office. She went to um, Paint Branch High School. That's when I learned that some students had to ride the bus for an hour, hour and a half. Uh, public transportation does not go on ICC. Um, but she spent the hour, hour and a half to get to my office because she wanted that opportunity. I still keep in touch with her to this day. I'm trying to recruit her to be a teacher in our school system. But then in 2019, our county council, uh, county exec's office, thanks to your help, we made sure that public transportation, whether it was public bus or WMATA, um, was free for our students. We share that every year. We make sure students know that to help defray the costs. Uh, Worksource Montgomery as a partner has increased the $300 stipend a year for students to $500 the past two years. They've confirmed that in 2023 it'll be $500. Um, a wider circle continues to be a, a, a pr provider of free professional clothing. We don't ask what your status is. If you want it, we, give, we get it for you. Um, I think those are all the, oh, and teacher liaisons. I think one of the reasons why this, oh, there's a financial literacy piece, there's a career exploration piece, there's a free bank account if you need it. It's not marketing for the bank, it is if you need it. Most kids don't need it, but it's free there. Um, they also help kids cash che checks if they need to. Um, and then we have a teacher liaison, and I think the reason why this program works is because we handpick teachers to match with students, knowing what the students' needs are behind the scenes, but then what are also the host's needs. If the host is willing to take a student that needs some accommodations, we make sure it's a win for both ends. And I think, I, I have some quotes and some stats from student feedback, host feedback, but I don't know if I have time, so I'm happy to share that if you guys want to hear that. Thank you so much, uh, Elaine. Um, last slide. And we have another slide. <laughs> Dr. Floyd. The very last slide. We certainly did not want to leave here without making sure that you knew and that our community is aware that we understand that there are more work-based learning experiences that our students have access to other than the four that you've heard about. The four we elevated because they are a part of our strategic plan and we wanted to make sure that they were shared and discussed here, but there are others. And as the council member shared, although we are not the team 
to talk about the literacy part and the work that has to be done and that's being done by our colleagues as they aggressively address the data that you pointed out. We believe just as passionately that it's critically important that we prepare our early learners for career experiences. And so they don't begin in high school, they do begin in elementary school. We had a committee a few years ago that took on the task to explore what are the experiences that our students have in high school, or I'm sorry, in K-12. And so this is not an exhaustive list, it's a visual that highlights some of the experiences that are available to all of our students at all of our levels. Um, the graphic is very intentional. It's a staircase that definitely represents the ascension as students get older, but it also provides the opportunity for students to descend and to re-engage in some of those experiences that they participated in before. We had 15 minutes, we're at minute 29, so I'm gonna stop here, and we are happy to engage you with any questions or any discussions you have for us at this time. Thank you so much, and I love this chart. I, you, you showed this this when you did it. I think it's a really good representation of the laddering up, literally the stepping up that we need to do and we want for all students. Um, I'll just ask a, a quick question and then turn to my co-chair and then we'll start, maybe we'll start on this end this time. We'll start with council member sales and go the other way. Um, you know, and thank you for tearing up, Elaine. It's really great to see progress there. Uh, appreciate WorkSource for sticking around and their support of, of, of Summarize. Appreciate the apprenticeship update, the internship update. One of the things that strikes me um, in all of this is the opportunity for, for scaling, right? And, and how we need to have, as part of our strategic plan, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, and I'm, I know we do, really concrete goals about how we are going to scale and it can't just be like we hope or you know we're going to try or no we need to know how we're going to do it and what are the resources that you're going to need to do it and how many you know how many employers are we going to need to engage if we don't meet the goal we don't meet it but we need to have it um and you know because i, I just when i was when we were as an example and i've shared this story with some of you when i went to uh, set up, we were setting up Summer Rise, and I met, met with all the other folks in the region who were doing summer work based learning experiences. You know, you went to Prince George's, I went to DC, and with those. Obviously, DC has a different model, but they are able to have historically have had tens of thousands of students every summer participate, and they're a much smaller school system than us, in, you know, uh, jobs in the summer. Um, and that, uh, that program has been going on for, you know, going back to Mayor Barry and it has a, a different history and a different, uh, you know, kind of foundation. And I, I like the, the way our program has developed, but we have to get there. We have to have a, you don't get there if you don't have a plan to get there. Similarly with internships, you know, I, I was looking at the numbers. They've gone down since 2019, right? You know, uh, that we can't, I, I want to know why and, and what are we doing and what do you need for us to not have that be the case because these internships are really rewarding, but we can't have it be a handful of students at every high school that has an internship opportunity. You know, apprenticeships, obviously, we're middle of the pack for the state, but there's more There's more we can do there. We are the largest school system in the largest county in the state. Um, so I would like if you could just briefly comment on the larger point, and if there's anything specific you want to add in on, how do you envision us scaling up, and what do you need uh, for us to be able to do that? Um, before they get into the content related question, I think one of the things that is an interesting contextual piece that I'm not sure you're aware of is in general, since we've returned from the pandemic, we've also seen just general attendance to school decline. Yeah. So we're dealing with a at large, I think, engagement issue with the school system that we're trying to unpack and figure out sort of what is going on there. There's a variety of different factors, uh, we suspect, uh, but we've recently started trying to go beyond the numbers to see what the story is there. So I'm not sure if that is connected to the internship issue, but I do think contextually when you step out to, I think, the largest system level view that is an observation that might be worth putting into yeah. consideration. We're definitely going to have an ENC meeting on attendance because it's a huge issue and the grading around that and all that, so that's something we'll come back to, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Dr. Fl I don't know who wants to go there. So in talking with our internship coordinators at each high school, part of the post-pandemic recovery 
employers were impacted and they were trying to identify their best way to bring their employees back to in person it did open up opportunity for virtual internships in some cases however our employers are still recovering and identifying how to get their primary workforce back and then how do they integrate that internship component back so that is one component and feedback of our internship coordinators but um moving forward i think in order to be able to scale internship apprenticeship having direct points of contacts with employers that we can engage and have that conversation and their willingness to consider a high school student in grade 11 or 12. oftentimes when we meet with some even bigger employers um, their first go-to is the college student. They want someone that has already earned their high school diploma, they're taking college classes, that's their, their entry point. So we are, as a district, engaging with employers and working together with WorkSource Montgomery. We've gotten additional employer contacts. I think as we look at our ecosystem and having direct points of contact that we can build pathways and support workforce development and career development at the same time are going to really be a game changer uh, for both our students and the workforce. I, I appreciate that and, and I would I would just say also I think we need to be looking at uh, different models because you bring up a good point right we're we're in a different work environment and people are trying to figure out who's virtual and who not you know whereas Summarize was able to use virtual to bring numbers up not everyone it's a lower commitment there and internships a full you know full year. Um, you know, I think I'd be interested for you all to go back and think about how can we maybe modify what happens during the year in the internship, what an internship, maybe it's an internship light, maybe it's more of an experience during the year. I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. I think if, if you had a, a summarized like experience during the year even, you know, that would get more kids work-based learning experience, you know, I just think, you know, we need to think about that because there are some limitations to the comprehensive internship approach in apprenticeships obviously even harder um, and then to your other point I know Steve connects with businesses in his industry Elaine you know with all of the things in her shop does business you know connects with businesses but you know that's something to take up with the board and to talk to us about is like that business development piece you know what's the role of work source it has changed over the years like is it their job in MCDC to help you connect to employers? Is it MCPS's job? Do you have the proper staff to do it? How can we help you? Because that, at the end of the day, you do have to have the willing partners. Um, and so there needs to be a strategy around that. It, you know, is it you and hiring people? Is it some combination of all of us working together to get those employers to the table? But uh, I just, we, we, that's, a, that's a nut we have to crack for sure. Dr. Floyd, and then I'll turn to I colleagues. totally agree, and, and we can't do any of this without employers. And so historically, I know the state, the Labor Board, has worked hard to incentivize employers, but I don't know if that's worked. We really have to find something that will inspire them to engage with our students. And those touch points are important. It could be brief, summarized throughout the year, and some of those experiences that we've listed before, but it all works together to help prepare students. I want to reiterate what was shared in the previous um, session around the partnership that we're going to engage in with our Workforce Development Board around career counseling. Again, we cannot wait until high school. We have to begin this work early. And so this is work that we have never engaged in when we're talking about working with employers and Workforce Development Board and advising our students in grade six, career counseling, career coaching. I do want to make sure that we understand the counseling program or the career counseling program per blueprint is totally different from the counseling that our high schools do and our middle schools do. This is about a coach or an advisor. And I think working hand in hand with Montgomery, uh, WorkSource Montgomery, and having them at the table to help us identify these experiences to bring in the employers, we will have more students who are ready. Another strategy that we are implementing is the use of intermediaries. And Mr. Crosser can speak more about that, but we have grant fundings to secure um, intermediaries that will help us bring in employees because employees are definitely key. And it's not only about the work-based experiences, but ensuring that they have the competencies. We spoke earlier about soft skills. I too don't use the term soft skill because they're not soft. They're critical, they're essential. 
and we call them career competencies. And we have worked hand in hand with our partners at MC and USG to develop these competencies. We were concerned about how we were going to roll it out. We are, I think it's perhaps serendipitous that Blueprint came out and we have the opportunity to engage in career counseling with our Workforce Development Board because through them we will provide these competencies to our students grades 6 through 12. So we're talking about over 87,000 students. So we have to engage in that work to ensure that they're not only college and career ready, but community ready and they have the competencies and the skills that they need to succeed. So it's not just about the numbers. We want to make sure our employers have quality individuals coming to their experiences. So we have to prepare them as we prepare to engage with our employers for the opportunities. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to turn over to my co-chair so we can catch up. Thank you for all that. I need to see a concrete action plan on how you're increasing business partners with schools. Maybe we can have another session when that can be, you can give it to us and we can walk, you know, walk through it. Something, this is, this is the goal, this is what we're doing, this is how we're measuring success. Give me the data. I speak with numbers, not with narratives. It's great to hear examples, but I want to see the data. Um, if we have, if we're giving, we have all these students in all these technical programs, how many of them are being certified and how many of, they, of them actually get jobs? Show me the data, don't give me examples. Because it doesn't, if you, if you highlight one example of one success case, that's great, but I, I need to see the data, otherwise it's just, it means nothing to me, um, you know? Like our board members. <laughs> and so we too have to be accountable to not only you, but to them, and they want to see the data. So we do have a plan. We welcome the opportunity to come back and share yes. more with you. We do have data that we have captured on industry-recognized credentials through our CTE programs. We do have information that we can share in terms of the planning, the strategic plan as we engage with our partners to increase. But we are doing some things, but we hear you loud and clear, and I don't know if Mr. Bowden wanted to add something. I thought I saw you reach for. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, I also wanted to uh, reassure um, the council here that we do have vibrant business partnerships and uh, very engaged business partners. And you're exactly right. Research shows that giving students that don't typically have access to those that run those companies is key to getting them to that next step, key to giving them influence as well. I'm going to give a quick example, even though you just said you don't want examples. I'm going to give you one anyway. Okay, um, this past uh, Friday, we had our friends at the Revenue Authority, Keith Miller, offer to allow our hospitality students to do a takeover. We took over the, the facility. The students uh, were prepared by owners of local companies. Ted and his team from Cava, our leaders from Marriott, um, our leaders from Mon uh, Visit Montgomery, as well as Squire and Associates from our Hospitality Foundation, work with those students side by side in preparation of it through the entire event and then did an evaluation afterwards. That gives students direct access to people who run these companies and it's amazing to see the connections that they make afterwards, you know, to be able to work, they create apprenticeships, they create opportunities at those companies. In addition, the data that you're talking about is available, and that's something that Maryland State Department of Education requires that we submit every year. Everything from enrollment data to concentrator data to completion data to how many students are getting industry-recognized credentials, it's all there. And we could look at long-term trend data to see, are we doing better? Are we making a difference? And how do we put together a plan, as you've indicated, to make it better? Um, also, you had asked, you had inquired with uh, Mr. Featherstone about the engagement to make sure that there are connections with the workforce board, the work source board, as well as the school system. And um, we do have a formal process in place, which he shared, the Montgomery County Collaboration Board, which is a group that represents our 11 career clusters. And we've got very engaged business partners in each of those areas guiding not only our curriculum, but also all of these opportunities you're talking about, whether it be career days, actually running student-run businesses. You, you already know we, we build a home, student design, student built. There are a lot of different ways that we engage students where they are. 
So um, I just wanted to reassure that that there is a thread that connects all of us. Is there an opportunity for us to look at the data and see how that thread can be strengthened? Absolutely. Love it. Thank you. Next time you come, I also gonna request. I'm going to request data on how you're tracking all those elementary schools that are falling behind. I want to see the process, how it's being measured, and how can we make sure that they're successful to get into middle school. So that leads to workforce development, making sure that the, this is a future workforce. I want us to know how we're doing there. So thank you. So when you say tracking, I just want to be clear, you're talking about the math and the little stuff. Yes. So we'll make sure next time we come that we have our colleagues from the curriculum office. They can join us and they can speak specifically to the math. Math, yes, with data. Thank you. And then, you know, embedded in that is this 25% blueprint goal, right? To have people 45%. So that was a misprint. I thought so. Okay. Right. And then, the, but the 45% goal is blueprint. Just let me clarify that. There's a 45% goal in Blueprint that students have industry-recognized credentials, which include a work-based experience such as apprenticeship, registered apprenticeship, by the year 2030-2031. And our strategic plan shares that we should have a goal in place by 2025 with the same percentage. Got it. And then what's the 25% number? The title. The work-based learning experience. And where are we today? We are at, what, 14%? So we've got two years to get there and, and beyond. And so that's the plan I'm talk, we're talking about. Like, we, that's what I really want to go over next time. You know, like, what are we doing? Where are the pain points? You know, not just that we have the goal, but, like, how are we going to get there? That's, you know, because we're going to need to help. And, and, we, and, and, and I think so often we, we uh, don't prepare our public and ourselves for what's going to need to be done to get there. And I think it's critical that you all have that plan and present it to the board and then come to us and so that we can make the case about how we help you get there. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to everyone for joining us. I know there's a great deal of expectation for MCPS and how you're preparing our future workforce. And I have to give a special shout out to Miss Arena LaGrange. She was my daughter's middle school principal at Tilden. So she's going to be a really good asset to ensuring that our middle school students have the resources they need or the programmatic needs are met um, to prepare them. So excited about this dynamic team. Um, and so I remember when my daughter started uh, with MCPS, uh, McCabry. Montgomery, Montgomery County's Business Roundtable for Education. I believe it was started under Doug Duncan's administration, and it seemed like a really good model. It's discussing, you know, it covered everything we're discussing now, and so I don't know how it phased out or what happened, why it lost funding, why it didn't, you know, uh, continue, but it seems like we are trying to reinvent the wheel for something that we already had, you know, groundbreaking results for. So just wanted to. If I could jump in, um, there was some feedback shared with Montgomery County Public Schools specifically. I actually chair a joint business advisory council for Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery College, and universities at Shady Grove. And based on feedback from business about not wanting to, and I'm looking at MTDC, I don't know if it's clear, not wanting to talk to multiple entities and 25 teachers at different schools in Montgomery College, we have been behind the scenes trying to align as an educational ecosystem, as you've heard Dr. Kadimian speak to and Dr. McKnight and Dr. Williams about being one voice with the business community versus, a, I don't know if McBree was a specific Montgomery County Schools one, I'm not sure, that it, I think it kind of phased out, but we're trying to do a bigger picture with the educational ecosystem. So. MC, MC, MCPS, MC, and USG together as a bigger make brie if you will. Well, the, the, I guess, uniqueness of McCabry was that it included the businesses, it included the economic development. Correct. Corporation, that, which was still in the county government at the time. So the vision would, and I don't want to speak too much because I'm just 
sharing conversations, and it's not 100%. So it's not official. Yeah. Not official. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the vision would be that business would actually advise what is their short and long-term goals, mm -hmm. how do we enhance what's currently at, at play with the different institutions, okay. including MCEDC and Works for Montgomery and other entities, ideally chambers. Okay. And I think also with uh, McBree, um, you're right, it did phase out. It was Bob Anastasi, then Jane Kubasic, who, who led the organization. Yeah. It was a separate, um, separate standalone organization, which mm -hmm. was made up of business members, mm -hmm. um, no longer in existence. But mm -hmm. the Montgomery County Collaboration Board has filled in and was approved by the Board of Education, the Board of Trustees from Montgomery College to serve as that advisory board. So it's made up of all business people with co-conveners from each of the institutions. And so currently the collaboration board serves in that capacity and provides guidance on where is our industry, where are the different industries going and how do we get there. So um, as you guys had mentioned earlier, we not only need to look at the careers of today, but also preparing students for the careers of tomorrow. And that's what that group is doing. And again, talking about that thread that pulls us together, um, you know, work source, workforce, Anthony uh, and team are included in this collaboration board so that everyone is working together along with the institutions so that they're hearing where our businesses want our educational programs to go. It's very important. So how, how old is that program and what results have yielded? Uh, the Montgomery, good question. The Montgomery County Collaboration Board was created in 2004 and it's taken on different forms since then. So you know, right now it's got a very vibrant group of uh, <laughs> business partners that guide where these programs are going. So for example, one of the um, give you an example, our, our IT program noticed that the students in our IT and computer science years ago were not reflective of the general population of our school district. And we looked at other curriculums that would help make computer science IT a more welcoming, attractive choice for students. Why are we losing them in middle schools? And so we've made changes to improve the enrollment. So you want numbers? Just a few years ago, we had 2,000 students in an IT computer science pathway. Now we've got 10,000 in middle school, 10,000 in high school. So we've increased the enrollment, increased the participation. So those are the types of changes that we see as important, and I know that we're going to continue making that progress. Okay, I just had one other question. I appreciate all the data that was shared earlier on the uh, apprenticeship program and the summer rides. Um, do you have any data broken down by geographic area and by race for the participants in those programs? Yes, we do. So would you like for me to share that now? Oh, if you want to share it now or in a follow-up document? Yeah, yes. I, I, we can follow up in a... I, let me just give you a brief summary. So for apprenticeship, when we look at the um, 26 students that have been in apprenticeship over the past three years, uh, 10 of those students have been black or African American, 10 have been Hispanic, and 6 have been white. And then when you look at internship demographically, 25% um, of the students have been black or African American, 25% Hispanic, 28% white, and 19% Asian. So that's our demographic in our current state of internship. I'd like to see that on a map of the county, just to see geographically where our students are being able to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, that just seems low for a program that's been around for almost six years. And so I'm not sure of the funding structure or how this uh, program is being funded. And, you know, um, Madam Chair asked about the needs or maybe it was Chairman Jawando. So I um, just wanted to get more information on what the needs are to bolster this program and reevaluate, um, you know, the outcomes. Uh, because when I think about half of our budget being invested in MCPS, more than half of our budget, what is the return on our investment? How many students are graduating from MCPS and coming back to work in our county can live here? You know, those are the long-term trends that I'd like to see to really, um, you know, um, 
justify the amount of funding that we spend because the numbers, as our chairwoman constantly reminds everyone, are poor. I mean, there was an achievement gap, then they called it the opportunity gap, and now it's just a sad, embarrassing gap for MCPS. And so we keep putting more money, we keep funding maintenance over maintenance of effort, and the results are not looking good for our black and brown students. And so, um, you know, I just wanna make sure that as we're thinking about these partnerships and these programs and these numbers that we are reminded that they are real people, it's our students. And if they are not going to have access to the resources and training before they leave MCPS, they're going to be a part of another line item in social services and I serve on HHS. So I wanna make sure we're doing all that we can with the resources that we can. So thank you to our co-chairs for putting on this meeting, I yield. Thank you, uh, Council Member Sales. And you know, rest assured we had our education and culture committee meeting and I had sent a letter to the superintendent and to the board saying that we're gonna be really focused on data and on numbers and on progress and on transparency and accountability for the more than half of our budget that we put. Um, and that these sessions that we're gonna have, and I'll say it to this group as well, that we want them to be data informed and driven. Um, and uh, you know, and so the superintendent agreed, my colleagues agreed, um, and so we're, I appreciate you sharing that sentiment. Um, I wanna turn now to Councilmember Balcom. Yeah, sure, oh, oh, okay, thanks. I'm just going to that. Oh, got it. Yeah, yep. yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, thank you all. This is um, a very important discussion. Um, so somebody had mentioned that um, MCPS needs a direct point of contact for employers. Employers need the same direct contact for MCPS. Just last week, I had an employer um, contact me uh, who I'd worked with before and uh, uh, contractor, building contractor, uh, wanting to get into, uh, to do internships in the schools and has been having a difficult time. I mentioned that we were meeting today and you know, we'll, we'll get, I'll get you the name and you can work on that. Um, it's a great program. It's, um, he, they, they build schools in Montgomery County and he's been wanting, and he, and he has M, uh, MC students working on site, but he would, love the idea of having high school students actually building schools in Montgomery County. Talk about a photo op, we need to make sure this, this program gets started, so I'll talk with you on that. But, but from the employer's perspective, it has to be uh, easy to establish the relationship. Uh, I know it's a, we, we need to protect our students, of course, but it has to be easy for the employer. And I also think um, that the paradigm has shifted from the employer's perspective of their engagement in education. Uh, employers know that they need to be part of uh, working together, providing opportunities for internships, working on uh, apprenticeship programs, because there is a worker shortage and, and they know that they have to be part of that. Uh, but it also has to be nimble. Um, we heard from WorkSource Montgomery this morning uh, that uh, the students that you're teaching um, in high school, let alone middle school and, and, and elementary, uh, the skill sets that you're teaching towards uh, may be obsolete by the time they're, they're, they're getting these jobs. So the programs have to be nimble um, and, and just wanted to make that point. Um, Several people mentioned scalability. I think that's really the key. I love the apprenticeship uh, programs, uh, but it's just a small dent. Um, looking at the blueprint, uh, blueprints uh, goal is 45% of graduates are credentialed in some way. Uh, by 2030, MCPS goal is 25% is by 2025. Um, so that's a gap, right? That, that's a huge shift to, to get that goal of 45% of by 2030. But to meet our, the needs of our students today and to meet the needs of our employers today, 
I think scalability is one of the most critical things that we need to talk about. Um, and I know that uh, that's a resource issue, but that really needs to um, uh, happen. And similarly, we'll have cultural and academic strengths and talents by integrating social emotional needs and honoring lived experiences to create a supportive learning environment. Um, and this sounds like exactly what we need to do, right, to make sure that our instruction matches the needs of our, of our students. And of course, this is closely tied to ensuring that they are workforce ready as well. Um, so that said, I know uh, as, a, as a former educator myself um, and from talking with current NCPS teachers, um, I know that the, the vast majority of them do not have enough planning time to realistically reach that goal as described. It's an enormous issue. Um, I also know that MCPS has, as of now, uh, not been willing to address planning time as an issue in past negotiations with our teaching staff. Um, and that lack of planning time is contributing to staff turnover in a very serious, fundamental way. Uh, it's an enormous concern. If we are not fully staffed, we cannot uh, fulfill you know, any, any of the wonderful goals and intentions that, that we have. Um, and so that is holding students back from being able to meet our college and uh, career and community readiness goals in a very tangible way. So my question is, um, how can we get to a place as county leaders where we're all recognizing that planning time is a serious issue, is a part of this equation, is a, is a major factor in what we're here talking about today, um, and where that issue is recognized um, both in the MCPS operating budget request and in the final operating budget allocation that the council makes um, through the budget process. If you could speak to, to that, that would be that would be appreciated. So I think it's a great question and I think it's certainly a question that we can bring back to our team and our colleagues and then I would ask that next time we come we can speak to it specifically because um, I don't think that we as a panel are prepared today to speak to it. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. But what I can add is that um, in addition to bringing it back, uh, so none of our members here sit on actually the negotiation table, for example, right. but I do go to a um, like bi-weekly negotiation caucus meeting. Um, so I'm happy whenever I hear, whether in the community or from staff members, uh, issues that I'm not sure if they're being discussed at the negotiation, mm -hmm. I pitch them over there and mm -hmm. hope that they um, are aware. Uh, I will say that I know that one of the things that is being discussed uh, in today's budget workshop um, is the um, potential addition of extra FTE, such as math coaches, equity coaches, et cetera, with the intention of um, there's a recognition that there needs to be more release time, whether it's for professional de development or planning, but you need staff to do that, right? Um, so I do know that we are taking into consideration from a resourcing and staffing model um, how you can get to the point where you can even create the space uh, in the schedule. Um, I also think, too, there's a point in having conversations um, with our building leaders, not office of you know, uh, school support, et cetera, uh, for principals and how we think about master scheduling, et cetera, and all of those. So I think that there's a lot of structural pieces that can go into place. Um, I think that there's uh, resourcing pieces. So all of these different elements sort of need to come and sort of be singing, I think, the same song, as you just mentioned, from leaders and systemically in order to start, I think, moving the needle on this particular issue. But we are definitely happy to take that back to what I would identify as, I think, the um, the key starting point for that conversation. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. And of course, I realize that, that you all before me are not our, our direct <laughs> entry point for that. I do appreciate the opportunity to raise it and to emphasize how closely these issues are intertwined, although I think normally when we have these conversations, they're very separate. But I think it's important for us to see that they are very integrated together as we're working towards these common goals and that, it, that it's an urgent issue for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn to Council Member Alvin to close this out. Thanks. I know uh, we're, we're over, uh, so I'll try to be brief. Um, couple thoughts. One, um, we need to double down and summarize. Um, Ms. Baxter Chang, you've done an outstanding job uh, in helping to coordinate, and it, it's a heavy lift. Uh, I'm always deeply impressed when we go to the culminating event every year, and the stories are extraordinary, the experiences are outstanding, um, but we, we need to take that to scale, uh, which means you're going to need more help. Um, so we, we definitely recognize that. And we're fortunate to have Councilmember Jawando on the dais who was intimately involved in development from day one um, of the initiative. So I look forward to over the next four years on this committee and hopefully beyond uh, doing what we can to 
establish an enhanced program built on this incredible foundation that we have already started because I think it will resolve a number of, of, of challenges and help take advantage of a lot of opportunities. Um, the other opportunity is that, and I said it in my initial com comments with our previous panel, you know, there's only so much we can do with the curriculum that we have in a day. There are only so many hours in a day. Um, and, and it's tough to fit in all of these incredible programs and services in addition to the planning, just logistically, you know, uh, to be able to squeeze all of this in. And so we need a paradigm shift at the state level to give us the flexibility at the local level um, and meet these opportunities. Um, because these programs individually are fantastic. They are making a difference for the students that participate. But it isn't part of the system change that we're going to need to be able to meet the demand that's out there and give us the flexibility to um, have even higher numbers um, sort of across the board. Students, for example, should be given a day, um, regardless of where they are, to be able to do those apprenticeships. Right now, that's impossible um, because of the requirements um, that are struck forward. And I have a strong feeling that, that Governor Moore gets all of that. Um, the, the emphasis on the, the year of service after graduation is like a really good sign uh, that so much more is, is here to come. And there are a couple of us that might have a cell phone number. So, um, so I think it would be a good idea um, for us to see what we can do in partnership with the state and test some things out here in the county, which I think would be really exciting. Um, last two points are, so one of my uh, 14 and 12 year olds favorite show is Shark Tank. <laughs> um, and, and there's like this Shark Tank generation um, that's being developed. We have these, there are kids that make more money than I do um, that, that are in Montgomery County Public Schools right now as influencers. Um, and there's this whole new entrepreneurial spirit and demand and opportunities um, that are out there that our students are primed and interested in taking advantage of. And the level of access that they had compared to what we had when we were their age just blows my mind. Um, and so there does, I think, need to be an opportunity or an emphasis from an entrepreneurial standpoint um, because I met a Montgomery County Public School student this summer um, who actually started a rideshare program, um, which was unbelievable. Like he was um, facilitating a process and making money off of helping to get his friends rides to different events and services <laughs> Um, and programs across the county. He monetized it like a 17-year-old kid. So uh, it's th there's a lot out there um, that I think we, we should be exploring and, and taking advantage of. And that is often, it unleashes other interests uh, and professional interests. And so it's, it's something I'd love for us to explore. Um, I'll yield back to our chair um, because there's so much more we can get into, but I look forward to the next ongoing conversations. Um, and I appreciate all your leadership. If I can make a Miss plug and invite you to attend our business pitch challenge. It's our form of Shark Tank on March 24th. And you'll see some of our students present their entrepreneurship ideas and members of our program advisory committee will judge and award gifts and they will invest play money into their companies. But it's an opportunity I think you would enjoy. So I, I want to say I've been a judge on that for a set, and it's it's a really really great program. Thank you. It's awesome. I'll invite all of us, Council Member Robert, will definitely be there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, appreciate those those comments, and as you see, there's a lot of interest from all of our colleagues. I'm going to turn to my co-chair momentarily, um, but we look forward. We want to help scale this, <laughs> and we have to. It's an imperative for the jobs that we need to fill today and the jobs that are here tomorrow. It's imperative for our economic and social well-being of our county. Um, and you all are an integral part of it. And so we, we want to make sure you have the support that you need across the whole continuum, all year round. And I'm glad we've got the whole year here represented throughout the, the programming. Um, so thank you, and we'll follow up. And one of the things we'll ask when we have the second session, and uh, my co-chair, one of the things we're trying to do in ENC is make sure you have, we'll do a call for questions of data and stuff beforehand so that we can have you come prepared to answer those. Obviously, we want follow-up to the list that was things that were asked today, 
but so we can have uh, that interactive discussion next time you, you come before us. Uh, basically, that was what I was going to say. I, I appreciate the list of everything that we have requested before our next meeting. Thank you. So thank you all. With that, we are adjourned.